Good morning. Good morning. It's Thursday. I can't believe it's March 28th. It's very much the end of the year. Replay crew, love you. Everything's going to be, you know, linked in chapters down below so you can skip to the part of the stream that you most want to see. There is so much to cover today. First of all, Lawnards, Corey Richens has caught a bunch, like a bunch of new charges. And not only are they just new charges, but there's like a whole explanation of all the new charges. I have not seen, the media has kind of picked up on one of this, one of these charges, but not the rest of them. Woo! Courthouse Becky resigned. I promised we would go over her resignation. We're gonna do that. It's gonna be basically a quick bit. I think all of you are gonna be like, this should have been an email. This should have been an email. This should have been an email. But we're gonna take a look at whether Courthouse Becky has learned anything or not from being accused of jury tampering. I'm going to guess or not. Uh, Alec Murdaugh. Why are we still talking about Alec Murdaugh? Remember all his federal cases that he pled to and the feds gave him a plea deal and we were like, interesting. The feds have filed to withdraw his plea deal. It is so rare. It is so rare that the feds do that when they make a plea deal. It is so rare, but there are a few notes on the docket that we are going to look at together because the court has already made notes on the docket so everybody everybody um including me here's the theme for today's stream you're in danger girl <laughs> corey becky alec you in danger you in danger you in danger you in danger um everybody every i don't know maybe it's eclipse season i i don't know everybody's um, got something coming for them, and it's going to be wild. CJ Chaos in the, the stream. See, I am a chat. I am a chat chaos gremlin. CJ Chaos in the stream said, this is a find out stream. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The, the fuck around has happened. Everyone is going to be finding out. Everyone is going to be finding out. So we have so much to talk about today. Don't worry. I know there's other news um, Sam Bankman Freed got sentenced to like, I don't know, 52 years in prison and uh, gave like a 20 plus minute speech. I'm sure the people who have been covering that will break down his speech. And as the media comes out, we might take a look. We might not. There are a ton of stories I want to get to before we get into the Karen Reed trial early next month. But tomorrow, don't forget. And if you have the Law Nerd app, you won't forget. LawNerdApp.com. Did, what did it say? 25? I thought it said 52. My brain introverted inverted them i'm disappointed now 52 would have been better 25 is meh <laughs> my brain my my lovely brain uh inverted those things so there there's that um friday we've got to go to court so you guys if you if you want to come to court we got to go to court on friday why are we going to court on friday because the defense's motion for new trial for hannah gutierrez is before the court the defense's new motion was like, trust me, bro. <laughs> she needs a new trial. What? So we're going to go through that on Friday. I'm going to go through the state's response. The state's response is basically they didn't do their assignment. So how can I do mine? It's kind of snarky. I talked about it in quick bits this week, but we'll go over that before the hearing. So we will do the hearing and we will do that. We're going to court on Good Friday. Yes, it probably won't be a Good Friday for Hannah Gutierrez read though. So yes, we are, we are going to court tomorrow. That is the court date set. Courts um, don't take a lot of holidays. Sure don't, sure don't. So um, yeah, we're going to court tomorrow and uh, we, need, we need to roll the intro and we need to get into it. So we're gonna start with Courthouse Becky and then I think we're gonna do Murdaugh, play Murdaugh deal or no deal and then get into all the new tea on Corey Richens. What time does court start tomorrow? Helpfully, it starts at 11. So we're gonna start at 11 and we will probably pick it up a little bit delayed because I wanna go over the prosecution's motion tomorrow before we go into court. And um, you know, I'll make sure I have multiple alarms set tomorrow so I'm not still asleep um, when I'm supposed to start streaming. So um, that's, that's where we're at. That's where we're at today. So 
11 a.m. Central, the Lawner app will make sure you get there. But we we need to go, we need to see what Courthouse Becky is doing first. But first, we need to roll the intro. Lawnards, thank you for being here. Don't forget to do all the the YouTube things. Let's roll. I've got coffee. You let me know where you're coming in from, what you're drinking. It's a beautiful, beautiful, like cool, crisp, sunny day. It it's it's real, it's real lovely. So I've got I've got like an actual hot coffee. Hey there, one. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. Big fan, big fan of the cursey words. Um, did I cut myself off with my own intro? I, uh huh. Yeah, I did. I, I apps, I absolutely did. But um, it's it was needed. Even, even my hand that pushes the button for my intro was like, girl, can we just get started? <laughs> can we please, for the love, just get started? So let me make sure our audio is queued up for Courthouse Becky. Let's do a quick road so far with her um because we're not we're not out of the we're not out of the woods of south carolina yet i mean where it's the low country woods swamps beaches we're we're not we're not out of the low country yet how about we just go with that let's do a quick road so far with courthouse becky clerk of court or former clerk of court becky hill um was accused back in september of 2023 of tampering with the murdoch jury the court when this finally came to hearing essentially ruled that yes courthouse becky had had ill-advised fleeting and frivolous conversations with jurors justice toll made it very clear that she believed that courthouse becky was not doing this necessarily for fame um or maybe because of the siren call of fame but in a i want to be popular type of a way cue emily singing but i want to be popular i want the jurors to like me i want to be in the middle of everything i want to be in the center of the cheese may i want i want to be known um i don't think she was doing it for money the defense kept trying to make this narrative happen they were trying to make fetch happen like she's trying to sell her book and she's trying to make money i think she wanted to be the center of attention i was on the 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 murda clerk of court I, the child of the century i don't know if they had bad blood she and Murdoch like went to high school together she went to high school with family members their family members used to moonshine together yes that's in her book um like generations back i think she very much wanted to be at the center of all of this i am informing that opinion based on going through the massive dump of her emails wherein she was kissing ass to Nancy Grace and signing like emails to Nancy Grace were signed XOXO Becky Boo and emails to other journalists were like, I'll get to you when I can. So she very much was also playing favorites in who was allowed into the courthouse when they got into the courthouse to watch Murdoch. So she was wielding and brokering in her own little world of power during that trial who she was letting in the the side door that didn't have to wait in line to get into trial things like that and the the media i don't give any shade to the media for playing into it because if the media is like oh if we just flatter her a lot we're going to get reserved seats and not wait in line yeah i no no shade to that at all but she was definitely definitely playing favorites with the murdoch trial and i think it was very much attention uh, attention behavior and wanting to be in the middle of it. Most clerk of courts are like, don't talk to me unless you need a Kleenex or a Band-Aid and um, be here on time. I'm gonna make sure you're here on time. If you get in a car accident, um, call me and that's about it. She wanted to be everybody's friend. And she talked about this in the emails leading up to the trial about how she wanted to roll out the red carpet for the world to see Walter Burrow and how she was inserting herself into tasks that necessarily weren't hers and was getting some pushback internally from it. But then, but then, but then, 
Then her son got arrested and charged with wiretapping. And the wiretapping seems to stem out of all of Becky wanting to be in the know about the investigation that was ongoing into the jury tampering that she was accused of. Her son was the head of IT for the same county where she was the clerk of court. She is also being investigated. The co-author of her book sat down and spoke with law enforcement on Friday. This press conference came on a Monday. Do I think the timing of that is um, coincidental? No, no, I don't think anything's coincidental. Do I think that there are going to be charges someday coming for Becky Hill? I absolutely, I absolutely think it's positive. I saw, I saw um, someone in the chat say "whoopsie doodle," and I almost said "absolutely doodle." My my brain is unhinged this morning. Thank, thank ADHD is a gift. So, do I think that we could see charges for Becky Hill? Yeah, I I, I think she might absolutely be involved in this wire tapping. And if you go back to the episode where I cover some of the emails, she's talking in the emails about how she can't wait to be vindicated and how uh, this is all essentially a witch hunt by Murdoch's lawyers, Dick and Jim, and how this is this is all just a, a big mistake. Well, ma'am, your, your son was wiretapping other people that worked at the county. It seems like that that was involved to listen in on what you were doing so let's go to this um let's go to this press conference that should have been a press release why do i think it's a press conference not a press release well ceg above attention why send out a statement saying i'm resigning when you could summon the media just by your mere presence and tell them that you're going to be there why would you want to do an email should have been an email. Um, but she's grinning like a cat. That's the, she's grinning like a cat at the beginning of this, like, I'm stepping down from my post. Ma'am, there are criminal investigations going on into you, and you are just as happy as can be to be in front of these cameras and be resigning your position. She had another year on her term, another full year on her term, and they have no mechanism to impeach the clerk of court in South Carolina. She could have stayed. So why now? Why now? Uh, good morning, everybody. I apologize for the audio being in mono. Uh, there's nothing I can do. If you are wearing earbuds, this is going to be in your right ear only. If you are only wearing a left ear earbud, you're not going to be able to hear this court. So uh, apologies on that. But this is the full conference. Other, other, uh, other locations where this press conference is don't have all of it. My name is Justin Bamberg, myself, along with Will Lewis, our counsel for uh, Miss Becky. Ma'am, why are you so happy? 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 Hill, the College of County Clerk of Court. Uh, today will be brief, but today's important. They announced this on Sunday, by the way. Look at, look at all those microphones. That's a lot of cameras right there in front of that courthouse. Obviously, over the last few months, uh, Ms. Hill has really wanted to address her constituents, um, obviously with- Sir, she's the elected clerk of court. Uh, Justin Bamberg is a lawyer, local in South Carolina, also is, a, um, also is in the state legislature. Things that were going on- I don't think they're her um, constituents. She has certain rights and, and she's got to protect herself most of which came under the advice of counsel um and that i think has been sir if you want her to protect her rights why are we having a press conference just put out a statement just put out a statement lost on a lot of people with everything that's been going on is that as clerk of court uh you do have a constituency the residents here in Carlton county and today could have occurred uh hiding behind a computer screen or hiding behind her lawyers and uh Mr. Bamberg, I appreciate that you are a very good lawyer and politician, and I appreciate the reframe on this. I appreciate the reframe. She could have she could have hid behind her cameras. Look, we're here to hear your South Carolina accent, sir. Let's just call it what it is. We're here to watch Becky grinning over something she shouldn't be grinning about and to listen to your accent. That's why we're here. That's 
that's what it is. We Utah has been pulling too much of our attention and we miss the fine state of South Carolina, but it wouldn't be hiding behind your computer to just put out a press release. Just saying. Uh, Miss Hill was committed to that not happening. Um, and I stand with her and I also respect her very much uh, for being here today. In front of the so cameras. Without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Miss Becky Hill. I am going to have thoughts. I'm going to bump the audio a little bit because it is hard to hear in the one ear. I'm um, I'm not going to interrupt Becky. We're going to probably watch it twice because it's short. Good morning, everyone. See if it we can It has been my honor that. and pleasure to serve as your Colleton County Clerk of Court over these past four years. The clerk's office has provided many services to the, coll to the citizens of Colleton County. The College and County Clerk's Office is proud of our services and the significant impacts we have made in the history of this South is the Carolina. we, the royal Here we. In the College and County Courthouse, you will find a full service passport office with certified agents ready to help you, as well as notary services and e filing that has streamlined our civil processes. Another significant impact in our clerk's office was in 2023 when we had to manage one of the biggest trials in South Carolina history. Our small town came together and made everyone proud. Managing they, they, the trial was such are, importance to the people of South are Carolina. You, are you sure? As well as of the national and international media interest and public scrutiny. And has I'm just waiting for her to give the opening hours and um, the the times that you can get a tour. Don't, don't forget that she is accused of um, giving tours charging for those tours and keeping the the money for 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 doing that it's caused me to reflect upon decisions involving my stay in the office of the clerk of court and so after much reflection i have decided that it is best not to run again for re-election i will now be able to focus on being a wife a mother and grandmother to my two grandboys and will be spending time with the people who mean the most to me with the upcoming election, I wanted to ensure that I provided ample time for other Republican candidates who may be interested in pursuing this position. I want to publicly thank all of the citizens of Colleton County who voted for me, who have supported me, and who have stood by me. I also want to take just a moment to extend heartfelt condolences to the family and friends of a very, very kind, professional educator here in Colleton County who has departed this life and gone on to the other life that she had. What are you, and what? Is the family of Debbie Price. And so today I just want to take a few seconds of silence just to remember. There's a moment of silence? We're, you're resigning. You're taking a moment of, you can't take a moment of silence in a press release. Emily. Emily, this this is why this is also this is this is why I do these live with y'all and do not watch them in advance because there is no there is no recreating the first time. Um, a, a moment of silence. She is resigning from office under criminal investigation, and she has told you you can come down, come on down on Tuesdays and get your passport. And she's taking a, a moment of 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 silence. Okay. Remember her and her family and friends. <laughs> that airplane is like what we're not going to do. I want to thank my amazing staff who work in the clerk of court's office for the wonderful job that they have done and that they will continue to do. Was it your staff that made the ethics we are complaints? We have strong leadership within our office. Is that I you? Am proud to say that our clerk's office will seamlessly move forward. I look forward to all of the future holdings. Sometimes when people have maybe an uh, overinflated sense of their own uh, importance, I wonder if she feels, me trying not to interrupt, I wonder if she feels like the she had to reassure people that the clerk's office would transition fine without her. Like, I, I know that I am 
she she's been in this position for three years y'all i know that i am the central key figure to making all of this work but i i promise you they will they will they will carry on uh without without me ma'am they did it before they do it after that's kind of how courthouses work and will finally remember the true amazing friendships that i have made while serving the incredible people of college and county i i, I can't <laughs> I have friends, you guys, you guys, I have friends. I have friends. I have friends. I'm going to tell you about my friends. I have friends. I made friends. People like me. And so as we fix our eyes forward, I would like to announce also that my resignation as clerk of court will be effective immediately. Thank you. signed copy of Ms. Hill's official press release of the press release that you could have emailed out to the press. Resignation uh, that will be forwarded to the uh, governor's office, uh, Governor Henry McMaster's office uh, later today. Um, I've served in the South Carolina State House for over a decade now. Uh, when we run as elected officials in this state, we run publicly. Um, our lives become public. We serve publicly, and it's only fitting, and, and I respect Ms. Hill very much, uh, that the conclusion of her service also happens publicly. Um, I'll uh -huh. be taking a couple of questions, but I do want to say one thing because I know that there are speculation and rumors. I uh, haven't lived in small town South Carolina my entire life. I can see where people... Justin Bamberg knows exactly what they're saying at the Piggly Wiggly, sir. They're gonna they're gonna keep saying it though. Those minds may run after an announcement such as this. So let me be extremely clear. Tell Today us is not in response whatsoever to anything going on with any investigation or or anything of that nature. You do, you do a good job for your client, sir. You do a good job. You do a good job for your client, sir. Um, with all due respect. We, we we like you we, we don't believe you um we we don't believe you we don't believe you for a minute everyone in the chat that said sure jan yes and i'm gonna say that one more time to everyone Today who said bless bless their heart bless his heart development of some investigation or anything like that <laughs> what new developments sir Today is not in response to any new developments in any investigation or something like that. It's not because that's awfully specific, awfully specific, awfully specific. Nature. Okay, and I'm going to say that one more time. Today is not in response to any new development of some investigation or anything like that. Uh, today is about the people of Colleton County. Uh, there is still another week. Um, available for filing for the clerk of court's office um and are any of her friends running so there's another week to file to run for office are any of her friends running it is what it is uh, if miss hill people could have filed to run against her without her resigning did you know that you know um you know what happens a lot in in large counties like la uh if like a judge is retiring and people don't know yet it's generally not done that people run against sitting judges. It is uh, it is not the way things happen unless that sitting judge has has like fucked up, like texting judge or pissed somebody off on a level where they're just like, you know what, I'm gonna take your job, but that's really personal. But judges will reach out to people that they know are interested in running for judge and say, I'm not going to be seeking my next term if you want to run for my seat, I will not be running again. And they give people the heads up. So she could have said to people, hey, I am not seeking reelection. And if you wanna put in to run for my seat, I will not be seeking reelection. That's different than resigning effective immediately. She could have served the rest of her turn. term. They can't yeet her from office. There's no method or procedure to do so. She could have announced that she's not seeking re-election and still served for the rest of the year. She resigned. 
Why did she resign? I think it's because of SLED. But stayed in office. Um, the people of Collison County would be the ones who uh, get. The real ones are the ones rolling through this town square with their windows down and their music on. Distracted to a certain degree uh, because there are a number of candidates running for clerk of court. Uh, those candidates have different things that they, different platforms that they want to campaign on. Um, and it would be inevitable that if Becky was still serving while those candidates were campaigning, um, every time they mention something, every time there's an article, every time there's a forum and candidates are discussing uh, the future that they seek to create for uh, the courthouse behind us, uh, there'll be a degree of a cloud over that because it'll be talking about the sitting clerk, et cetera. So again, she could have announced that she was not seeking reelection and it also would have stopped all of this. This decision was made wholeheartedly by Ms. Hill uh, for the benefit uh, and, and to the benefit of the citizens of Collison County. Uh -huh. uh, we will not address any investigation stuff, whether it be SLED or state ethics or anything like that. Uh, so please, uh -huh. I know it's tough. I can see some of the faces out there. No questions about any of that. Uh, if you do ask. <laughs> Why do I feel like he's looking at us, chat? Justin Bamberg is like, I can see your faces. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to dodge it uh, because we're not going to comment on that. We're not going to detract. Uh, from he's the, straight up like, you can ask. Of today, the we're the sweet positive nature of today uh, with that. So with that said, um, I would like to acknowledge behind us faithful members of the clerk of court's office. Huh. It's interesting that the other clerk of courts are standing with her after the hearing that we all saw. Interesting. Uh, these are dedicated employees to the people of Collison County. Um, and we want to thank them for everything that they uh, have been doing, everything that they will continue to do uh, so that we can continue to make Collington County as great uh, as it is. Uh, so with that said, happy to take any questions. I'm not going to talk about the investigations. Whichever reporter this is has said, okay, so let's talk about what Justice Toll said in January. Let's do that. Um, I mean, I, we respect Justice Toll, and uh, she is a, a longtime jurist in this state. I don't think you'll find any lawyer that doesn't respect her, um, and we respect her decision in court. Uh, we respect her review of things. And uh, the comments that she made, uh, she is former Chief Justice told. Uh, so at present, uh, with the resignation of Ms. Hill, uh, the deputy clerk will uh, step in immediately to, to effectively run the clerk's office. Um, and we anticipate that at some point in the immediate future, Governor McMaster will, will appoint an interim. a formal clerk yeah. of court. Uh, to step in and actually be uh, formally in charge. But for right now, uh, and that's one thing uh, that, that took some timeline and everything up to make sure uh, that with this decision, the clerk's office could continue to run. Stephanie, that is her lawyer who is speaking. He is a lawyer in South Carolina. He's been a lawyer for some of the victims of Alec Murdoch. He's also a sitting, sitting in the uh, state house legislature. I mean, I, I think Justin Bamber, he did a great speech at Murdaugh's uh, sentencing. Every time I have seen him talk, I'm just like, I can understand why your constituents voted for you. I understand why your clients like you. I just don't believe that this doesn't have anything to do with it, with a criminal investigation. I just don't. I like Justin Bamber. I think he's doing a great job for Becky Hill. I just, sir, no. There are times when you look at you look at uh, the things that lawyers are saying for their clients, and you're like, um, yeah, no. Effectively, efficiently, 
uh, for litigants and for the citizens. So uh, there will be no gaps in service whatsoever to the people of Causey County. Gary Hale Jr. In fact, he's standing right behind me. Um, I'm, <coughs> I'm currently here and I, I'm on the county's time and I can't discuss that right now. <laughs> When you are running for office, when you are a county employee, you are not allowed to engage in any campaign activity while you are um, on county time. So anything you do would have to be after your work day. But sir, I, I think we would vote for the beard. I, I think the chat would vote for the beard, sir. So he is the deputy clerk of court. He will probably be he will be the one that will step in and fulfill her duties. And I believe he is also running for clerk of court in Colleton County. And that is exactly what you want a clerk of court to do is to know the difference between their duties and um, what they can and can't do because there's a lot of rules they have to follow. <laughs> Without a doubt, my grandchildren. If you have grandchildren, you know. you know. Chat, you just let me you just let me know if you believe her. You just let me know if you believe that this is all about the grandchildren or if the desire to spend time with friends and family has something to do with the investigation. Um, because I would think if the resignation had something to do with a health issue or something that would also make you consider time, that that would have been stated, right? Like the, I think that would have, there would have been more to that. I, I think there, she wants to spend more time with her grandkids. I just think the investigation is probably a part of that. So you're saying your resignation had nothing to do at all with the investigation? No, sir. What, what, <laughs> the resignation. I'm waiting for him to say, what part of don't ask those questions do you not understand? <laughs> is strictly about the people of Colleton. Um, and again, we're not going to get into uh, any of the investigation stuff and all that as things are still open. Uh, but the primary and the main focus of uh, today is what is in the best interest of the constituency, the, the public. Um, and this ended up being... Again, she could have just said, I am not running for re-election and let everyone know that she was not running for re-election. It's gonna be real interesting to see what happens in the coming weeks. The, the, out of the options that were on the table, for example, uh, just not running again and staying in office through the election, et cetera, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that ran the risk of uh, detracting or impeding the public's ability to uh, get digest information from candidates about what they want to offer. Um, so that's why that's why the decision was made. We'll take one more question. Yes, sir. I can't hear the question at all, and I can't identify what song is playing out of the windows, and I feel like that's a lose lose for us. Um, I believe. I, I would have to double double check, uh, but I believe the governor would have the ability to make an appointment. Um, I don't know that there would be a special election. However, that would not that wouldn't be out of the question. Um, that question would probably be more uh, directed for state ele uh, state election commission. Um, and if there is a special election, of course, uh, that will be announced um, by the the powers that be in the elections office, um, and then folks will campaign and. Um, the result will be the result, and then you will have your normal election in November. Um, so thank y'all so very much. All right. Well, there we there we go. Um, Clerk of Court Becky Hill could have sent an email, didn't want to send an email, was just grinning ear to ear that uh, she is resigning from the position of Clerk of Court on Monday, effective immediately. Yes, she could have just sent an email. Yes, she could have just done a press release. Yes, she could have just announced that she was not seeking re-election to pave the way for other candidates to throw their hat in the ring. But with Becky Hill being um, under investigation and having 
also been determined to have spoken to jurors during a high profile trial. I'm sure people were already fairly comfortable throwing their hat in the ring to run against her. I don't think that that was um, something that wasn't happening already. And there were options for her. They said that they didn't want, and they being Becky Hill and, and her attorney, Justin Bamberg, they didn't want this election when clerk of courts were questioned at public forums. I have never seen an election where the clerk of court is at a public like Q and a form, but I digress. Didn't want it to be a cloud over the proceedings now where other clerk of courts have to address it. I think if that were the case, they could have said she's not seeking reelection and I'm not going to comment on it. It is what it is. So um, yeah, it could have been a press release, but Becky, I think very much wanted to have a press conference. And I think her lawyer, look, when you see zealous advocacy in action, sometimes you don't agree. But I think Justin Bamberg did a very good job of saying, you know, she didn't want to hide behind a computer. She wanted to look y'all in the face and tell you why she was resigning from office. Becky, everybody would have read a press release and gone, okay. People are talking about it more because you had a press conference because most of the conversation is why the fuck do you think you needed a press conference for that? But again, I think that Becky's impression of, of the attention um, warranted or otherwise directed at her is different than the um, maybe the reality of the situation. I'm very, very curious as to how this wiretapping investigation is going to go. Like, that's all I want to know about. Like, is Becky going to be arrested? Is Becky involved in the wiretapping? What else are they investigating Becky for? The ethics complaints that I went over in other coverage indicate that people believe, these are allegations in her ethics complaints, that she was taking money to give tours of the courthouse. So, you know, Let's see what happens, shall we? Do you guys think Becky's gonna start a podcast? What's the over under? What's the over under on Becky starting a podcast? <laughs> I feel like that's the next step here. I feel like we're just, and will it, and will it be, will it be with one of the housewives? Will it be with one of the cast members of Southern Charm? No, I'm teasing. Will it be with Teddy Mellencamp? She needs another podcast. Will she start a podcast or another book? All right, you guys, I think because we're in South Carolina, we should stay in South Carolina. Um, <laughs> Brian, Brian in the chat said, find yourself someone who loves you like Becky loves Becky. I feel like there's a lot of that going around in the uh, Murdoch case, right? A lot of it going on in the Murdoch case. Should we just talk about Murdoch? Should we just stay in South Carolina since we're here? I feel like we didn't even officially fly to South Carolina. Before we go back to Utah, we've we've spent a good bit of time in Utah, but should we just stay in South Carolina? I feel like that's the right thing to do. Yeah, let's just, we're gonna just go ahead and stay in South Carolina. Let me pull up Alec Murdaugh's plea agreement amongst other things. Uh, let's see. Let's get Emily. Are all of your documents in the place you thought you put them at like one o'clock this morning? No. Corey Richens's are. Murdaugh's not so much. All right. Let's. Oh, there we go. Let's do. Where is his indictment? Emily, where did you put the indictment? There you go. Let's go through Murdaugh's indictment real quick, just as a refresh. Then we're going to go into his plea agreement. Then we're going to go into the full document asking to withdraw his plea agreement. Sound good? Sounds good to me. Alec Murdaugh was indicted by the federal government. Um, when was this? Let me make this a little bit bigger. Back in, I mean, the man had over 100 charges. I kept making the 99 charges um, joke, but he had over 100 charges facing him state and federal. So, Murdaugh, Murdaugh had a lot going on. And uh, this is part of it. This was May 23rd, 2023. Why does it feel like it was 100 million years ago? So this is the uh, stealing money from certain identified clients. We're going to just get to the charges involved with Russell Lafitte, who was already charged. I broke this entire indictment down 
somewhere in the entirety of our our content with Murdaugh. At some point, maybe we need to break the Murdaugh trial out into its own playlist, like trial in one playlist and all the other legal shit in another playlist. I don't know. But it goes through all of the scheme, all of the money moving around, the theft from different clients' uh, funds. Count one being conspiracy to commit wire fraud and bank fraud. Count two, bank fraud. Count three, wire fraud. Count four, wire fraud. Count five, there's the one of the charts of theft. Count uh, counts eight through twenty-two, um, the forge, the fake forge scheme, and so all of those. Where are those? There's a chart for those. All of those are the fake forge scheme, conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Um, counts nine through twenty-two, money laundering. These are the dates of the alleged laundered. Well, he pled. These are the dates of the laundered money. And then a civil forfeiture, like whatever was yours is now ours, over $7.6 million. They are alleging that they can forfeit. So that's kind of a quick overview of the 20, what was it, 22 charges against him federally. Most of those charges carry 30 years. A few of them carry 20 but most of them carry 30 and then there would be an enhancement for the amount of money stolen so let's go through the plea deal that he took on these uh 22 federal charges this is separate from all of the state charges he pled to in the state charges that he pled to he got 21 22 years on those and then he's got the multiple life sentences on the murder charges so he pled to the federal charges before he pled to all the state charges. Do you remember, we watched all the hearings on the state charges because Creighton was like, I am going to tell you everything that happened in all of these charges. And then he was sentenced to the plea deal, was it 27? Sentenced to the plea deal on those charges. So then he was facing this plea deal. He had made this plea deal before he pled to the state charges. That was getting ready to go to trial. November 2023 we were gearing up for like a holiday trial we're like all right we're back in South Carolina and right before trial started he pled so let's go through this plea deal and what the feds had offered him in this plea agreement back in September I covered it then but um I imagine that there's a lot of you have forgotten the ins and outs of this because um a lot of shit has happened since September <laughs> so do you remember? Sorry, let's let's jump into the plea agreement. In consideration, look, look, it's just like a, you know, it, it, it's the contract. You get your consideration in there. You've got a, You've got a meeting of the minds. In consideration of the mutual promises, mutual between the feds and Murdoch, the parties agree as follow. The defendant pleads guilty to counts one through 22 of the indictment. Oh, I could have just read this one. It was fun to scroll through the indictment, Emily. Don't don't lie. It was fun. They go through all the counts, um, each and every one, that he is agreeing. Count one conspiracy, July 20, uh, 2011 to October 2021, that uh, he entered into a conspiracy or agreement to commit wire fraud and bank fraud, that this carries a maximum term of 30 years and a million dollars plus five years of supervised release. Bank fraud, same thing. 30 years, fine of a million dollar, wire fraud, same thing, uh, maximum 30 years, fine of a million dollars, supervised released, count eight, same thing. Oh no, count eight, conspiracy to commit wire fraud, 20 years, there we go, I knew there was one of them, $250,000 fine, nine through 22, money laundering, 20 years, $500,000 fine, and they go through all of the different counts. Defendant understands that the obligations of the government within the plea agreement are expressly contingent on the defendant's abiding by federal and state laws and complying with any bond executed in this case in the event that defendant fails to comply with any of the provisions of this agreement and we're going to get into those provisions in a moment either express or implied the government will have the right at its election to void all of its obligations under this agreement and defendant will not have any right to withdraw his or her plea of guilty to the offenses so if you fuck around, your guilty plea stands, but the deal, the benefit of the bargain is gone. And then you just get sentenced. So what the state, well, we'll get to what the government is arguing. So in the plea deal, 
they said, you have to plead guilty to all 22 counts and you are being told that the maximum potential sentences, 30 years on these, 20 years on these, a million dollars of fines on these, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines on the other ones. Here is the defendant's agreement. This is what Murdoch told the government he would do. The defendant agrees to be fully truthful and forthright with federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies by providing full, complete, and truthful information, full, complete, truthful information about all criminal activities which he or she has knowledge. The defendant must provide full, complete, and truthful debriefings about these unlawful activities and must fully disclose and provide truthful information to the government, including books, papers, documents, or any other items of evidence to the investigation. Defendant must testify fully and truthfully before any grand juries or at any trials or other proceedings have called upon to do so by the government. So if there are any co-conspirators left out there that have not been prosecuted yet, have not been tried yet, he has to agree. Um, and he has to testify truthfully and the government decides what truthful means. I remember when we covered this originally, I was like, why would anyone sign this? This one was, this one was a lot. Like, I don't think Murdoch can stop lying. So why would you sign this? Like his attorney saw him testify at his trial before this happened. Like, why would they say, yeah, that seems like a great idea, buddy. The defendant must uh, testify before any grand juries or trials or other proceedings if called to do so by the government subject to prosecution for perjury for not testifying truthfully. So if you get the plea deal and you testify and we think you're not truthful, we'll go ahead and re-prosecute you for perjury. The failure of the defendant to be fully truthful or forthright at any stage will, at the sole election of the government, cause the obligations of the government within this agreement to become null and void. If we think you're lying, we don't have to do anything we agreed to. Further, it expressly agreed that if the obligations of the government within this agreement become null and void due to a lack of truthfulness on the part of the defendant, the defendant understands that. They're telling him in this agreement, if you are not fully truthful and forthcoming with us, this is what is going to happen. He will not be permitted to withdraw his plea deal. All additional charges known to the government may be filed in the appropriate district. So if the government had held back in any way, they're like, <laughs> we're also going to file the rest of it against you. The government will argue for a maximum sentence for the offense. The government will use any and all information and testimony provided by the defendant pursuant to this agreement or any prior proffer agreements in the prosecution of the defendant for of all charges. I remember losing my mind at all of this. I have never seen a proffer agreement like this. Generally in proffer agreements, if, if your agreement is withdrawn, they cannot use what you said pursuant to that agreement against you down the road. So when we look at like a Dave Hall's proffer agreement, if we look at that down in the, in the future, you will generally see, hey, if we don't offer you a deal or if you don't take it, anything we talk about today, we can't use against you. We can't use these negotiations against you. What they've said is, um, if you fuck up, everything we talk about, we're going to turn around and use against you. Just in case you were wondering about what the full extent and power of the federal government looks like, here it is. The defendant agrees to submit to polygraph examinations as may be requested by the government, agrees that the examinations shall be performed by a polygram examiner selected by the government, further agrees that his refusal to take or failure to pass any such polygraph to the government's satisfaction will result at the government's sole discretion in the obligations of the government within the agreement becoming null and void. They told him, if you fail a polygraph, we will yeet your deal. And it is at our decision. You know, I, if I was his lawyers, I would be like, sir, the federal government is never going to be satisfied. I would then probably sing Hamilton and say the federal government is never going to be satisfied and nothing you do is going to be good enough. And this is a terrible, terrible idea. Terrible idea. 
The government agrees that any self-incriminating information provided by the defendant as a result of the cooperation required, although available to the court, will not be used against defendant in determining the defendant's guideline range pursuant to this plea agreement. The provisions of this paragraph shall not be applied to restrict any such information known to the government prior to the agreement concerning the existence of prior convictions or sentences in a prosecution for perjury or giving a false statement in the event the defendant breaches the terms of the agreement. If you breach the agreement, anything that you've told us, we will use against you at sentencing. Provided the defendant co cooperates or otherwise complies with the condition of this agreement, the government agrees to recommend to the court that the sentence imposed on the charges be served concurrent with a state sentence for the same. That's all they agreed to. We'll let it run concurrent. The defendant understands that this recommendation would be in lieu of a motion for downward departure. We're not going to argue that you should get less time. We'll just argue that you should serve your time at the same time as your other time, which means that he got 27 years in the state. Whatever they sentence him to in the Fed, it would run concurrent with that 27 years. And then if anything happened to the murder conviction, that it would still run concurrent so he wouldn't essentially have a state sentence of 27 years, a federal sentence of 20 whatever years, and then have to deal with the two life sentences. So this left open a window of possibility that if, and I'm not saying it will happen, if, hear me, if, if something were to ever happen to the sentences on the murder conviction, that he would only have 27 years and this would be running concurrent. So there would be some window of far off possibility that maybe one day, maybe he gets out of custody. Maybe. But he is in his 50s. I mean, early 50s. So at 27 years, it's it's possible. I don't I don't think that the murder sentences or the murder uh, convictions are going anywhere. I don't think that um, that that's going to change. And I don't think this is going to run concurrent anymore. So we'll get into what that means in a minute. The defendant agrees to voluntarily surrender and not contest the forfeiture of any and all assets. He's like, I don't give a fuck. There's nothing left. <laughs> the receivers already got everything they can find. I wonder, we're going to find out what they think he's lying about. I haven't read that yet. It's a first look. But I wonder if they think he's hiding, hiding the money. Defendant agrees to voluntarily surrender to and not contest forfeiture of any and all assets or property or portions thereof that are subject to forfeiture pursuant to the provisions of law. What can the feds forfeit? Basically fucking everything. The feds can substitute assets. They can be like, we think you bought a car with criminal proceedings. And if you watch my coverage of the Omni and a Hellcat case, it was like dozens and dozens and dozens of car. My kid has asked me to go back and see if there was a Supra on there because we were talking about Hellcats because he looked at me and was like, do you know what a Hellcat is? I'm like, child. I learned that last year when we covered the Omni and a Hellcat case. I was like, of course I know my, my kid being a car obsessed. So my kid's like, can you go back in the list and see if there's any Supras in there? I really want to know if there's Supras. But anyway, if the, um, if the feds are like, oh, you spent criminal proceeds and you bought this car, but that car is gone, but you've got this other car, we can take the other car, we can substitute, we can swap it out. We can just be like, give me that one instead. Federal forfeiture is wild. There are many a defense attorneys who look at the federal forfeiture and are like, how is this even legal? Um, look, with the feds comes great responsibility. Wire fraud can cover almost anything. Same with civil, cons same with uh, conspiracy, same with RICO. And then they can substitute anything. They'll be like, oh, at some point you probably bought a phone with that. We're going to take this one. Another day we will get into the immense power of federal forfeiture. If they can find it, they can take it is basically where we're at with federal forfeiture. Uh, it's been challenged. It's held up. If you fuck around with the feds, they will take every, they will take everything. Everything. They will, they will snatch your wig. They will take literally everything. Um, and that too. We saw that in the Jen Shaw raid when she was arrested, that they took everything out of her house. And then the feds did that whole motion where they were like, this one was a fake Gucci bag. That one was a fake Chanel bag. This one was. And they were so disappointed that so many of the luxury bags that they seized were fake. They were so upset. So upset. 
Anyway, um, a sum of money equal a sum of money equal to all the proceeds the defendant obtained directly or indirectly from the offense. So over $9 million is what the feds want to grab from him. They're going to have to fight the state over where Murdoch's money lies. Defendant agrees to all of the forfeitures. He can't object. He can't oppose. He basically, you lie, you're done. And that is, this is all pages on the forfeitures. This is like, hey, today, baby, I got your money. Don't you worry. Said, hey, the, the feds are coming for your money. So that's all that. Let's go, let's go to what they're saying now. Let's go to how Alec Murdoch pissed off the feds, shall we? That's um, I don't, I don't advise pissing off the federal government. A, they have immense power. B, um, they can be petty. C, uh, they they do not take kindly to being lied to. Um, yeah, the the feds, the feds do not like it when uh when you breach your agreement to them and out of all the prosecutorial agencies i've seen the feds make more plea deals than any other agency the feds will flip literally anyone on a plea deal and be like good got you you're going to testify against you perfect when you see anyone associated with p diddy being arrested know that that first conversation is probably what do you know and do you like prison oh you don't like prison great tell us everything you know and they will they will flip up the chain and and flip and flip and flip it's how the whole college admission scandal started they they got a guy for something that guy was like okay but there's all these like coaches taking bribes. Like, can I tell you about this? Like there's all these parents like bribing coaches to get their kids into school and like bribing admissions offices and stuff. The entire college admission scandal came because one person was like, okay, but let me tell you what I know about this over here so I get less time. That is exactly what the feds do. Uh, it's what happened in the Jen Shaw case. I imagine the second Jen Shaw's first assistant, Stuart Smith, had handcuffs go onto his hands. Stuart was looking at them going, call my lawyer and what do you want to know? Because I've got all of the tea and I will spill it for you. Like, they, especially in white collar crimes, there is no honor among, among co-defendants when you get to the white collar crimes. Someone is going to tell the feds everything. Everything. All right. Let's let's see let's see what Alec Murdoch didn't tell the Fed. They don't like not being told things, man. You mess with the Feds, it's gonna trigger all of their childhood trauma of people not wanting to play with them. Like let's let's not do that to the Feds. Their feelings are gonna be hurt. They are going they are going to feel abandoned. Sorry, federal agents. I, I don't I don't mean to pick on you. Um, I did used to try cases that weren't like confessed to on video, but you know it's it's what it is government's motion to hold defendant in breach of plea agreement this was just filed with the court on march 26 what day is it today is it the 28th government's motion to hold defendant in breach of plea agreement when he pled guilty pleaded guilty the defendant richard alexander murdoch look i say no name calling but his first name is richard can you call him dick i mean his name seems to be dick alec murdoch I'm just saying it's in the name. Agreed to be fully truthful and forthright with the government by providing full, complete, and truthful information about all criminal activities. That was my italics voice. I don't know why that was weird. Um, about which he has knowledge and submit to a polygraph examination at the government's election. And then they hearken back to the document that we just read. In exchange, the government agreed to recommend Murdoch's federal sentence be served concurrently with any state imposed sentence for the same conduct that's the 27 years he got on all the financial crimes alec has failed to cooperate as required under the plea agreement and has failed a polygraph examination administered at the government's request Sh i shocked pikachu face shocked pikachu face shocked pika shocked pikachu face Uh, that's sealed, by the way, which is unfortunate. Murda has thereby deprived the government. The government is so deprived. Deprived the government of the benefit of its bargain. The government requests the court find Murda breached the plea agreement and 
uh, relieve the government of its obligations, footnote one. On March 18th, in an effort to comply with Local Rule 12.02, Government Council notified Murdoch's Council that we intend to file this motion. <laughs> Hello, Dick! Uh, y yeah. So, uh, remember that plea agreement we talked about? No, that's, uh, that's gonna be a no-go good buddy. We're still gonna sentence him on, on April 1st, which, coincidentally, is, like, Monday. So, I think, unless they moved the date, I think he's being sentenced on April Fool's Day, which is just too rich for me to even deal with. I am so delighted by the fact that his plea agreement is getting yoinked and he's gonna be sentenced on April Fool's Day. But we're gonna go take a look at the docket after this because I checked it last night. Things could have changed between then and this morning. Uh, background on May 23rd, the feds charged Murdoch via grand jury with a 22 count indictment with conspiracy to commit wire and bank fraud, bank fraud, wire fraud, money laundering. These are a lot of the same charges um, that we covered against Jen Shaw, that we covered against, um, that we covered against um, Jen Shaw and who else? Uh, the Chrisleys and others. So 22 count indictment, those are the counts we went over it. Murdoch pled guilty to the counts pursuant to the plea agreement footnote two. Prior to the plea agreement, the parties signed a proffer agreement under which Murdoch agreed to be fully truthful and to submit a polygraph, submit two polygraph examinations in exchange. The government agreed not to use his own statements against him. The plea agreement contains a merger provision, however, under which the parties agreed that the plea agreement contains the entire agreement of the parties. That's going to come up more, I would imagine. Under the terms of the plea agreement, Murdoch agreed to plead guilty to all charges, to fully cooperate, to waive his rights, to contest his conviction and sentence in an appeal or post-conviction action, footnote three. The waiver included the standard limitations for claims of ineffective assistance of counsel, prosecutorial misconduct, and future charges in the law or future changes in the law that may affect his sentence. So there are a few very limited caveats. I don't think he's gonna have any, any room to argue that Dick and Jim were ineffective. Um... And not to contest a forfeiture of money judgment of a minimum <clears throat> of $9 million in exchange for the concessions provided Murdoch cooperated and complied with the conditions. The government agreed to recommend the court impose a sentence served concurrent at any state to any state imposed sentence for the same conduct, the financial crimes. That would be 27 years. Murdoch's obligations to cooperate fully were detailed in the standard cooperation language requiring him to be fully truthful and forthright. We just went over that. The plea agreement provided that Murdoch's failure to be fully truthful and forthright at any stage will, at the sole election of the government, cause the government to withdraw its agreement and the agreement to become void. Similarly, the agreement stated that Murdoch's refusal to take or failure to pass a polygraph to the government's satisfaction will result at the government's sole discretion and the government's obligation becoming null and void. And if the government's obligations became null and void due to Murdoch's lack of truthfulness, the government notified Murdoch that it will argue for maximum sentence for the offenses which he has pled in addition to other available remedies, and Murdoch will not have the right to withdraw his guilty plea. You pled, you deal with it. And what you're going to deal with is the Fed saying, sentence him to all. Uh, Green asked in the chat, but aren't polygraphs unreliable? Polygraphs are not used in court to prove that someone did or didn't do a thing, but the feds do use them um, in circumstances like this. And Murdoch agreed to it. So he's allowed to make this plea agreement. They can't use it in court for other things, but they can use it to withdraw his plea agreement here. Should he have agreed to this? No, why would you sign this? Why would anyone sign this? This is an awful, this plea agreement literally gets him nothing. It, it, it benefits him none. I don't know why he would assign this. Uh, arrogance, perhaps. Pursuant to the terms of the plea agreement, Murdoch was interviewed by the United States Attorney's Office and the FBI on four separate occasions, May 4th, June 7th, August 18th, and October 18th, 2023. See all the sealed exhibits. Gosh, I wish they, wish they weren't sealed. Footnote four, a SLED task force officer embedded with the FBI was also present during the interviews on August 18th and October 18th. Of course, SLED was there. Cleopatra said, can you refuse to take a polygraph? In this plea agreement, Murdoch could not have refused to take a polygraph because Murdoch 
uh, agreed that refusal to take it would yeet his plea agreement. So no, he couldn't refuse. In other circumstances, the answer is vastly different, but different circumstances are different circumstances. So I can't give you a broad, broader answer to that. Um, you know, if you're going to talk to somebody that wants to polygraph you and you're not like on a reality TV show, talk to a, talk to a lawyer, talk to a lawyer, talk to a lawyer. Um, Mimi in the chat said, can they unseal these? We're going to talk about why they are sealed in a minute. And we're going to look at the docket and see if there's any more information when we finish with this before we get to Corey Richards having a stacks of new charges. Um, the government notified Murdoch that it will argue for maximum sentences for the offenses in addition to other additional remedies pursuant to the plea agreement. He was interviewed. There we go on those four dates. Against the backdrop of Murdoch's admitted confession of financial crimes in South Carolina spanning decades and the convictions of co-conspirators who facilitated and benefited from Murdoch's crimes, the government has a duty to pursue all available avenues to investigate and prosecute others who may be responsible for violation of federal laws. And with more than six million in proceeds remaining unaccounted for, excuse me, Alec, the feds would like to know what the chat would like to know. Where the fuck is the money? Where's the money, Alec? Hmm? Where? Bahamas? Where it where is it? Where is the money? How do you hide six million dollars? Does Sam Bankman Fried have it? Alec, we have we have questions. The feds are not happy. The feds are not happy. The feds are not happy. More than six million in proceeds remaining unaccounted for. The government is compelled to make every effort to identify the location of any ill-gotten gains to make Murdoch's victims whole. Although Murdoch accepted responsibility for the charged criminal conduct and admitted his involvement with co-conspirators Russell Lafitte and Corey Fleming, the government believed Murdoch had not been fully truthful as required under the plea agreement, despite numerous interview sessions during which the government gave Murdoch every opportunity to be fully truthful and forthright. I, the last interview must have been like, we're going to do this one last time because we don't believe that you're telling us the truth. And I imagine Murdoch's interview with the feds looked exactly like his testimony during his trial. Don't you? I, just, just word salading around the answers and just like, I, you know, I, I think Murdoch thought that he could talk his way out of all of this. Um, sir, the feds are used to people trying to talk their way out of things. That's one thing they're really good at. The government decided to polygraph Murdoch on the issues related to hidden assets and involvement of other attorney, of another attorney in Murdoch's criminal conduct. This is why I think it's all sealed. That's why I think it's all sealed. There's, I think there's somebody else that they're targeting. On October 18th, the FBI polygraph examiner administered a polygraph examination to Murdoch in two separate series on the topics of interest. See exhibit one sealed. The examiner determined that there was deception indicated in both series, meaning that Murdoch failed the examination. Following the examination, the examination charts and data were forwarded to quality control who made the ultimate determination confirming that there was deception indicated on both series. The government now requests that this court find Murdoch breached his obligations under the plea agreement, thereby relieving the government of its obligations, including the obligation to recommend a concurrent sentence. And then they have case law cited holding that government cannot unilaterally determine that a defendant has breached a plea agreement, the court has to ultimately agree. The government must be relieved of its obligations under a plea agreement only after hearing and a finding that the defendant has breached the agreement. Legal authority and argument. So then they're going through the legal authority for plea agreements. The government's allowed to make plea agreements. The government's allowed to withdraw plea agreements, but the court has to be the ultimate arbiter of that. I've been a part of these hearings when we've had defendants who have taken deals and then lied on the stand. And then we're like, um, so your honor, liar, liar, do you agree? And the court will have all the sealed data. And then they're going through all the different language in South Carolina. And that is their full motion. The government therefore requests that the court hold Murdoch in breach of his plea agreement and find the government's obligations null and void, relieving the government of its obligation to recommend a concurrent sentence, footnote five. 
A defendant who breaches a plea agreement cannot withdraw his guilty plea. As a reminder, there, um, let's see, are there any other footnotes that we missed? Nope, that is everything. Um, yep, that is everything in this. Let us go to the docket and see if they have bumped back his sentencing date because of this, because they're going to have to have a hearing on this. Let's go to Pacer real quick. They're going to have to have a hearing on this, and we're just going to pull up the docket together and see if there's anything new this morning. And we're going to look at some of the really interesting notes on the docket um, all together now. Let's see. This my my pacer docket of cases that we're tracking has gotten um untenable. I need to go, I need to digitally cull some of these cases and see what's closed and what's not closed. We have a we have so many case updates. We need like an extra, extra, extra stream of just case case updates. All right. Nothing new new from yesterday. So this first one. What's interesting about Pacer is that different states have different colors of the background. So if you're looking at multiple cases across different states, the background color will be different. Some are yellow, this one's blue. It's always interesting to me to see how the different the different systems work together. But anyway, that's me being a nerd. Uh, from yesterday, text order as to Dick Murdoch. The government has moved to seal three interview reports of the defendant with the FBI and a report of the results of defendant's polygraph examination filed in conjunction with the motion to hold the defendant in breach of plea agreement. Defendant may file a response to the motion to seal before 4 p.m. on March 28th. It's so ordered. So if the defense is going to object to any of that, they have to do it by today at 4 p.m. Um, this is from March 15th. Notice, as to Richard Alexander Murdoch, Notice is given that the court may consider at the time of sentencing an upward variance from the proposed guideline range set forth in the pre-sentencing report. This is before the government filed their motion trying to withdraw the plea deal. The court got the pre-sentencing report and notified all parties on March 15th, 11 days before the government was like, we're not adhering to our plea deal, please. The court put everyone on notice that the court intended to consider an upward variance. So whatever the pre-sentencing report said, the court intends to look at more time to take whatever the recommended range is because the, the feds do all of this on a graph and there are, there are formulaic determinations of where you fall on the graph and what that range is. And you can either upward depart or downward depart from that. The court is saying, I know that that's what they're recommending. I think we're going to I think we're going to do more than that. I think we're going to go up. And that was before they knew that he lied. So let's see where is our sentencing date? It's in here. Notice of hearing April 1st, 10 a.m. Charleston Courtroom 1. This is the feds. This will not be videotaped. I'm sure there will be reporters in court telling us what happens. I appreciate that. This is in federal court. I can't be in South Carolina um, on Monday, but people will be. We'll cover it. And we'll see what happens. The court can hear this hearing before the sentencing and make a determination. I will circle back today at the end of day because I really don't think I'll still be streaming at 3 p.m. Central Time when this is due today. We were on Tuesday. But I will circle back and update you in the app. Um... Caitlin said, I feel like I don't hear about upward variances happening too much. Is that common? No, it's not really common, especially in nonviolent crimes. Remember, this is just focusing on the financial crimes. But when lawyers steal from their clients, there is little that pisses lawyers off more. This behavior pisses off lawyers. So I will update you in the Law Nerd app. I have been using or I've been using different social media apps differently. And I've kind of consolidated that, consolidated that all into the Lawnard app. So if something happens today, I'll just update you in the Lawnard app. Uh, question, did you use Pacer in the DA's office or did you have different access? We didn't need Pacer because we generally didn't have anything that was going on federally. And if we did have stuff that was concurrent or going on federally, the federal agents that brought us stuff would bring it to us. So I used different systems 
when I was in um, the DA's office. But I have I have made sure that we have access to all of the systems we can have access to to cover these cases, including access to the system in Utah. Chat, we need to go back to Utah. Chat, we need to go back to Utah. I will keep you in the loop on what's going to happen with all of this on Monday, and I will keep you in the loop on the Lawnard app. So if you don't have it, this is my plug for the Lawnard app. I'm also going to say, do the YouTube -y things. I'm still trying to prove to my 12 year old that I am a real YouTuber. We're still trying. We're still we're still out in these streets trying to prove it. Um, because again, for those of you that aren't familiar with what my son regularly says to me, it is, um, I will say something like, but buddy, I interviewed Sir Mix a lot. And he's like, uh-huh. And I'm like, but buddy, I spoke at VidCon with YouTube on their behalf. But buddy, I have Reed, my amazing partner manager at YouTube, and he works with these other creators who you actually watch. Like, we have the same partner manager as like these other creators that you watch. And do you know what he says to me? But those creators have an M after their subscriber number. So, um, for everybody that knows children, they keep it real. Those, those other YouTubers do have an M after their subscriber number. Thanks, buddy. So <laughs> we got, we got to get to that M and then I'm going to just talk to you about the app all the time. <laughs> oh, my youngest is ruthless. Can I, can I tell you a story real quick about the ruthlessness of this child? My 12 year old does not have a filter at all. We are working on it to, to help him maybe um, work, work within people's expectations a little bit better in the world, which is hard because he's like, there is nothing but unvarnished truth from him as he sees it. There is no filter between someone may be offended by this because he does not see the world that way. I live in a very neurodiverse household. So we were talking with my oldest and we were filling out a, a medical form for something. My oldest is trying out for like elite summer competition band and we were filling things out. My husband was filling out the forms, which is a new thing for him too, because we've, we've shifted some of those tasks in our, in our home since I am busy doing this. And I'm like, you can fill out a form. You're fine. You're, you're fine. You have quite a lot of advanced training. So my husband was asking what my advanced degree was. And my husband and I ended up getting into a rousing debate about what level of advanced degrees we had because Dr. Baker was like, well, what is your degree? And I'm like, technically it's also a doctorate. It is a Juris doctor. So my degree level would be doctoral. He's not, not a professional degree. I'm like, I mean, I, I, they're, they're kind of synonymous, but no, it's a, it's a, it's a doc. You asked me what level of degree. So now we are having this argument about the level of degree. Don't worry. We've also thoroughly debated in our household the fine nuanced differences between Panic at the Disco and Fallout Boy. These are the things that happen at our house. So my husband is like arguing with me over whether my degree is a doctoral degree or his degree is a doctoral degree. And I was teasing him about whether other doctors were considered his doctoral degree a doctoral degree because he is a DDS, a doctor of dental sciences. I am a JD, a Juris doctor. And so then we were getting into the, I, I texted Judge Abbey at one point, and then we were getting into the nuanced differences of doctoral level degrees and, and the history of the Juris doctor and the lawyers wanting to separate themselves apart from other professionals. And he's like, but I, I went to four years of dental school. I'm like, this is not a good argument. I went to four years of dental school. You only went to three years of law school. I'm like, okay, bet. Then I got the same level degree in one less year. That makes me smarter. Like I achieved my doctorate in three years and it took you four years to get yours. Meh. And he's like, okay, but I think yours cost more. I'm like, also still a doctoral degree. Yeah, probably did cost more. So Dr. B and I are now debating the doctoral level degrees. And I'm like, well, why don't you call me doctor? Then why don't you, in this household, I think you just need to start calling me Dr. Baker as well. Like we'll both be Dr. B then if you want to do this. And Travis at this point is dying laughing as the two of us are arguing over the level of our degrees and whether or not they are doctoral level degrees or professional level degrees to put on this thing. Um, and he is just like, Ugh. and I'm like, right, well, 
you know, doctors of physical therapy consider themselves doctors. Like it is a doctoral level. Either way. Griffin chimes into this conversation and says, does it matter that dad's the only one still using his degree? Griffin, what? What did you, what did you just say to me? What did you just say to me? Does it matter that dad is the only one still using his degree? <laughs> that, and that was, <laughs> that was the conversation slowly going sideways. And I was like, child, I do legal commentary. I teach law nerd university. I am basically at this point, a self-appointed law nerd professor with a microphone. Dad teaches dental school. How is it different? And he's like, aren't those students going to become dentists? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, are the law nerds going to become lawyers? I'm like, yeah, a lot of them are. He's like, but they go to other law schools. So on and on and round and round we go. But my husband was just dying, dying laughing with my kiddo being like, I mean, dad's still using his degree. I'm like, the misogyny hurts, child. It was just the funniest conversation. So then we argued over what it means to still be using your degree in our raucous debate at our house over what level degrees that we have. And I'm like, look, everybody's student loans are paid off. Does it matter anymore? So this is why when I say you need to like and subscribe, it's because I need the validation of my 12 year old. <laughs> um, no, I'm only only partly kidding. But these are the these are the conversations that happen um, at, our, at our household. I don't I, it look. <laughs> I've learned how kids can be. I taught swim lessons and I lifeguarded growing up and I have always been light sensitive. I've always had a, a, a wide fleet of neurological quirks. So I wore sunglasses, like generally pretty cheap ones, even when I was in the water and often wore a hat even when I was in the water just to reduce the glare. And I was teaching swim classes and needed my glasses to be off as I was teaching something and took them off. And one of the kids looked at me dead in my face and went, oh, Oh, you're, you're not as pretty without your sunglasses on. Th thank you. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to wear glasses for the rest of my life. N noted. <laughs> God, children are, children are so much fun. Um, Smurf Anna said, li uh, lifeguard glare is insane. Yeah. And I, being a light sensitive individual, it is, it is just, it is just a whole situation. Shall we, now that we've uh, giggled about children being absolutely charming um, and delightful, shall we, um, shall we talk about Corey Richens? Should we talk about Corey Richens? I think, I think that we should, I think that we should. Uh, let's go to Utah. Do we need to fly again? I feel like we do. I, I love getting to fly. Let's, let's fly like an eagle friends. Let's just, um, Let's do it. Where, where did, where did Lawnard Air go? EDB Airlines. Um, this is going to be a quick flight. We serve, you know, water and or champagne and or your choice and delicious snacks. Oh, Corey. <laughs> if you thought the walk the dog letter was the worst thing that was going to happen to you in this prosecution, you are... You are wrong. You are certainly wrong. Um, the chief prosecutor, by the way, in this area of Utah's name is Brad Bloodworth. Mr. Bloodworth isn't letting anything go in this case. If you're not familiar with Corey Richens, Corey Richens um, is pending prosecution for the alleged murder of her husband with a 5X the lethal dose of fentanyl in his Moscow mule. We recently covered Corey when a newly unsealed search warrant brought to light that her mother was involved, perhaps, in the suspicious death of her partner shortly after she had become the beneficiary of that partner's estate. 
so weird. And in that search warrant, they were looking for probable cause, again, not a beyond the reasonable doubt standard, but they were looking for probable cause to show that Corey's mom's phone needed to be searched, arguing that Corey's mother showed disdain for the victim, in this case, Eric, Corey's husband, and that Corey and her mom were very close and spoke quite a lot, and that Corey's mother was at the home the night that Eric passed away. We're going to get more information, I think, about that today. So there was a concern that Corey's mother was involved in a conspiracy to commit murder, and that is what was in that unsealed search warrant. Then prosecutors in Utah dropped an entire new charging document. Art by Julie E in the chat said she's the one that wrote a children's book about grief, right? Yes, she was just promoting her children's book about grief when she was arrested a year after Eric's death. Oh, Corey, let's let's get into what they're saying that you did now. First, we're going to review the original charging documents just so we are all on the, let me take this down so that we're all on the exact same page. You guys know that the Lawnard app is where I'm going to update you. As I was saying earlier, before I switched tax and started talking about my kids for some reason, um, I was reminding you that I'm not spending a ton of time on other social media apps. So the updates are going to come through the Lawnard app because it's where I want to spend my time and here on YouTube. So community tab post, member tab posts, um, member spaces and the other spaces and then in the app. Original, this is the OG charging document from May, I believe. She is charged with count one, criminal homicide, aggravated murder, alleging that on or about March 3rd, 2022, the defendant died, uh, or no, the defendant killed the victim by the lethal amount, dosage, or quantity of a lethal substance. So essentially poisoning. Possession of a controlled substance with account, intent to distribute count two. Possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute count three. Possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute count four. And then gave a brief overview on the information supported by probable cause. Remember, Corey, this is a four-page document. Remember, Corey is getting ready. Where is our date? I don't see the date on this. Corey is getting ready to go to preliminary hearing on May 15th. So will that date get pushed now that there's new information? It's always possible. So what was that? Four counts, chat, we're keep, four counts, one count of murder, three counts of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute. We're going to talk more in depth about what those things mean as we get into the new 14-page charging document. So there is a substantial amount of new information in this charging document. So let's see what the Bloodworth gang is charging Corey Richens with now, shall we? Because have you guys see, here? Have you guys seen the news on this? Let me ask uh, in the chat because I saw brief coverage of this. Um, had have you seen that Corey had yeah, new? Like this, the mods put it in our mod chat. And I was like, wait, what? And then I pulled the document. I'm like, oh, there is so much more here. Like there is so much more here. So I was just curious if you guys had seen this yet. Um, all right. Count one, criminal homicide, aggravated murder. This is now a slight variance because this is charged as a domestic violence aggravated murder that between March 3rd and March 4th, 2022 in Summit County, defendant intentionally or knowingly caused the death of another individual under the following circumstances. The actor, defendant, committed homicide for pecuniary gain. That's new, monetary gain, and or committed homicide by means of the administration of a poison or of any lethal substance or of any substance administered in a lethal amount, dosage, or quantity Furthermore, the defendant was a cohabitant with the victim. So it is now charged more specifically under domestic violence for the gain, monetary gain, and by poisoning. Attempted criminal homicide, aggravated murder, domestic violence. On or about February 14th, 2022, and we've heard about this. February 14th, 2022 in Summit County, the defendant intentionally or knowingly attempted to cause the death of another individual by the following means attempted to commit homicide for pecuniary gain, attempted to commit homicide by means of administration of a poison. 
We had heard rumblings that Eric, the victim, had complained that he thought Corey had tried to poison him in the past. And that there is evidence that Corey then asked for like more or stronger fentanyl. And we're going to learn more about that shortly. And that um, that is when or about when he put his sisters as the executors of his estate because he was like, um, I think my wife is trying to poison me. So this was February 14th, 2022. He was killed on March 3rd, 2022. Distribution of a controlled substance, March 3rd, March 4th. The defendant knowingly intended to distribute a controlled substance. Distribution of a controlled substance, February 14th. The defendant did intentionally distribute a controlled substance. I think they're charging these on the giving of the drugs to Eric because I don't think she had like, traditionally when you look at intent to distribute, <clears throat> you're thinking that somebody has like wholesaled drugs and then they're going to go sell those narcotics um, and actually like deal drugs to others. This is, I think, intended to be distribution. She had an illegal substance and gave it to Eric. <clears throat> Mortgage fraud. Oh, what now? What now? We now have how many counts? Of, how many counts of mortgage fraud do we have here? Mortgage fraud, June 29th, 2021. The defendant did with intent to defraud make material misstatements, misrepresentations, or omissions during the mortgage lending process, intending that be relied upon by the mortgage lender, borrower, or other party to the mortgage lending process. So we're going to end up with a murder case with a whole bunch of financial crimes. So what you're telling me is, while somebody was also defrauding people, they killed their spouse? That's so weird. I've never ever seen that happen before. Um, furthermore, the value of the property, money, or things obtained exceeded $5,000. Mortgage fraud count six. On August 2nd, 2021, in Summit County, Utah, defendant with intent to defraud made a material misrepresentation or omission during the mortgage lending process. Insurance fraud, what now? Two counts of insurance fraud from January 29th, 2022. Um, or and the second one between January 29th, 2022 and August 31st, 2022. Did with the intent to deceive or defraud intentionally, knowingly, recklessly devise a scheme or artifice to obtain anything of value by means of false or fraudulent pretenses, valued more than $5,000. Forgery. What now? June 29th, 2021 and August 2nd, 2021. Forgery. Third count of forgery, January 29th, 2022. Mm. We are now at 11 counts. Murder, attempted murder, mortgage fraud, forgery, and insurance fraud. Oh boy. It's a it's a uh it's a murder trial with a side of financial crimes. And that is page four. We now have 10 pages of what they're alleging that Corey Richens did. So uh, buckle up. This is a first look for me. It's probably a first look for you. Let's uh, let's see what the uh, the state of Utah has to say about Corey Richens. Eric Richens died from illicit fentanyl poisoning. At 3.21 a.m. on March 4th, 2022, defendant called Summit County Dispatch and reported that her husband, Eric Richens, was not breathing. He's cold. He doesn't have a pulse. Ten minutes later, EMS personnel and sheriff's deputies arrived at the home. They performed life-saving measures, but ultimately declared Richens was deceased at 4.58 a.m. EMS thought, quote, he'd been dead a while and noted that he was a systole the whole time. So this was not, this was not a help, help, he just stopped breathing. A pathologist at the medical examiner's office, or the office of the medical examiner, OME, performed an autopsy on Eric Richens, concluding that his immediate cause of death was drug intoxication fentanyl, determined that the level of fentanyl was 15 uh, NG slash ML, which is approximately five times a lethal dose, and that his gastric fluid contained an additional 20,000 20, NG slash ML of fentanyl. So the amount of fentanyl in his system that was undigested 
was 20,000. The 15 in his blood is five times a lethal dose. That's new information. 20,000. Undigested. His body processed the 15 and it killed him. The medical examiner determined that the byproducts of the fentanyl found in Eric Richen's gastric fluid were typically of illicit fentanyl, not medical grade fentanyl. This is what the chat suspected the last time we went through this, but it wasn't explicitly said how they determined that it was illicit fentanyl. And now we know it is the byproducts um, that were mixed in with the fentanyl are not medical grade fentanyl. The ME determined the fentanyl found in Eric's body had been orally ingested. Well, it was in his gastric fluid. The ME also found 16,000 um, NG ML of quantipine. I think I pronounced that right. Quanti, quantipine. In Eric Richen's gastric fluid. It is a atypical antipsychotic medication used for the treatment of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and is widely used as a sleep aid due to its sedating effect. The defendant told law enforcement at the time of Eric's death she had the prescription for quantipine. The night of Eric Richen's death. At 7.22 p.m. on March 3rd, the night of Eric Richen's death, the defendant, uh, defendant's, the defendant's paramour text messaged the defendant a photograph of two people kissing that was captioned, love you. At 8.36, the defendant responded, love you. Wait. Was Corey having an affair? Chat, did... Was this known? These are not texts from Eric. Like, chat, chat. <gasps> I did not think we were getting to an affair with this because I didn't know anything about that. Did I miss it in the other legal documents? Defendants Paramore, not the band, text message defendant a photograph of two people kissing that was captured love you. At 8.36, defendant responded, love you, kiss emoji. No, this is defendant. Defendant texting a paramour. If defendant was texting with victim, it would have said defendant was texting with victim. This is, this is the night her husband died. These are her texts with somebody else. <sighs> Boy, <coughs> for those of you saying, what is a paramour? A band. No. What is a paramour? Um, a lover? A lover? <laughs> her, her lover? While EMS personnel attended to Eric Richens, the defendant told law enforcement that she and Richens had a drink together at nine o'clock after the, the text messages to celebrate something at work tomorrow. This was a closing of a home. A year later, defendant told law enforcement, I made Moscow meals in the kitchen and I brought them into our bedroom. D okay. The defendant further stated that they drank Moscow mules sitting on the bed. Sometime after Eric Richen's death, defendant wrote in a journal that the night of Eric's death, she and Eric went into the kitchen and both started grabbing ingredients for a Moscow mule and a lemon drop. We finished talking, made our way back to the bedroom and brushed our teeth. Brushing your teeth immediately after drinking a lemon drop sounds absolutely disgusting. On the night of Eric Richen's death, the defendant told law enforcement, we eat THC gummies. Sometimes Eric will eat a gummy before he goes to bed. It, he didn't, it didn't seem like he did though. Yeah, he's not high, ma'am. A year after Eric's death, the defendant told law enforcement she saw Eric take a THC gummy in the bedroom after drinking the Moscow Mule. Well, the THC would have been in his system. The defendant then clarified, I don't actually see him take it. He told me he took it, and then he had to have taken it while I was making the drinks. Ma'am, he's not high. In explaining to law enforcement how the defendant thinks the fentanyl got into Eric Richen's body, ma'am, the self-snitching, the self-snitching. Law enforcement loves nothing more than a defendant who thinks they're smarter than them, trying to explain to them what happened. It is a very powerful interview technique. Just explain to us what happened, Corey. We just, can you help us understand? We want to help you.
can you just tell us? And the defendants, particularly fraud defendants that think they're smarter than everybody, will try to explain because they think they're going to pull one over on law enforcement. You're not. You're not. You're not. You're not going to. In explaining to law enforcement how the defendant thinks the fentanyl got into Eric Richen's body, the defendant said, I honest to God think it was one of those gummies. A hundred percent. After the defendant's arrest for the murder of Eric Richens, the defendant's mother asked defendant if she was sure the fentanyl came from a THC gummy. The defendant replied, that is what I'm banking on, yes. Well, that's an odd turn of phrase, isn't it? That is what I'm banking on, yes. The OME did not find any THC in Eric Richens' blood or gastric fluid. The THC gummies in Eric Richens' home at the time of his death were tested and did not contain fentanyl. No, ma'am. Don't blame the weed. Can weed be laced with fentanyl? Yes. Is that what happened here? Nope. The defendant told law enforcement that she went to bed with Eric in the bedroom at approximately 9.30, 9.45. So what, they just like, Drank a mule, immediately brushed their teeth and climbed into bed. That seems that timing also seems odd to me. On March 3rd, 2022, um, sorry, between 9.30 and 9.45 on March 3rd, 2022, shortly, shortly thereafter, one of their children, um, wait, and shortly thereafter went to one of their children's bedrooms to sleep with the child because the child was having nightmares. The defendant, that's not what her cell phone says. You know when Alec Murdoch's cell phone was all moving around and then it just went dark for a period of time? I wonder if we're going to get to what her cell phone was doing. Oh, yeah, we are. Um, went to the children's bedroom to sleep with the child. The defendant says she woke up in the child's bedroom at approximately 3 a.m. on March 4th and returned directly to the bedroom. Defendant said she was asleep in the child's bedroom the entire time. Defendant told law enforcement, your phone's going to tell on you, Corey. Defendant told law enforcement that when she left the bedroom at approximately 9.30, 9.45 to go to the child's bedroom, she left her cell phone plugged in next to her bed and did not take it to the child's bedroom. They can tell if you did or if you didn't. The defendant told law enforcement that upon returning to the bedroom, she felt Eric Richens and he was cold to the touch and not breathing. She immediately called 911. Summit County Dispatch received her 911 call at 3.21 a.m., on March 4th, 2022. Won't it be interesting to hear that 911 call at the preliminary hearing in May? Forensic analysis of the defendant's cell phone shows that it was unlocked six times between 3.06 a.m. on March 4th and 15 minutes later at 3.21 a.m. when the defendant called 911. This analysis also, also shows that in the 13 minutes between 3.08 and 3.21, the defendant's phone or an associated device traveled approximately 378 steps. So... Before she called 911, uh, stuff happened. She did not just touch him and go, oh, fuck, and call 911. Other things happened. The defendant told law enforcement that she performed CPR on Eric Richens pursuant to the 911 dispatcher's instruction. What, on the bed? The 911 recording captures the defendant counting as if she is performing chest compression, compressions. The defendant told her best friend, quote, I pumped so damn hard so hard screaming at him to come back to life. The defendant wrote in a journal that she, quote, began CPR compressions until the EMT arrived. They immediately took over. According to EMS personnel, dispatch says she was doing CPR, but the first on-scene fire guy said she wasn't. <sighs> Eric Richens nearly died on Valentine's Day 2022. A certain dinner in Camus, Utah. Oh, that sounds, certain diner. That sounds ominous. A certain diner in Camus, Utah, opens at 7 a.m. Okay. okay. At 8.53 a.m. on February 14th, 2022, the defendant placed a one-minute phone call to the diner. The defendant and Eric Richens' joint bank account statement shows that $41.29 shows a $41.29 purchase at the diner on this day. Okay. At 9.41 a.m., the defendant text messaged her paramour. At 9.41 a.m., the defendant text messaged her paramour headed that way. At 9.49 a.m., the defendant text messaged him a screenshot of a navigation application on her cell phone showing her current location on SR32 in Camus and her projected arrival at an unknown destination at 10.49 a.m. 
Ma'am. Ma'am. You had to go, you had to go see, see your, your lover on Valentine's day. Did you? Okay. At 11.09 a.m., Eric Richens placed a two-minute call to the defendant. At 11.27 a.m., Eric Richens text messaged a photo to the defendant. The photograph has been deleted from both the defendant's and Eric's phones. At 11.33 a.m., Eric text messaged the defendant, I'm going to go lay down for a bit. If I don't start getting better, I'm going to head to the hospital. One minute later, defendant responded, geez, is it that bad? Need me to come home? Question mark. Go to take a nap and call me when you're up. Five minutes later at 11.39, activity recorded on Eric's phone and associated devices ceased. Activity did not resume until nearly two hours later at 1.32 p.m. At 1.43 p.m., Eric texted the defendant and asked, are you home? Question mark. The defendant responded, no, in Provo, waiting for my cabinet installer guy. Are you home? At 1.45, aren't they sharing location? I bet Sheena Shea has all of their locations. Somebody asked Sheena, Sheena, where was Corey Richens? She would know. Um, Eric responded, in the office, I've been sleeping out here. Eric's office was located in a freestanding structure behind his home. At 1.59 p.m., Eric called witness one, a close friend, and reported, you almost lost me. Eric told witness that defendant had left him a sandwich and a note in the front seat of his truck. He went into the house with the sandwich and had one bite of the sandwich and broke out in hives. Eric said that he then injected himself with his son's EpiPen that was on the counter, drank a bottle of Benadryl, and went to sleep. Um, I'm just, I'm not a doctor. I mean, I did work as an EMT, but I'm not a doctor. If you feel the need to EpiPen yourself and drink a bottle of Benadryl, call for help. Call for help call for help. Just call for, just call for help. I know the medical system in the U S is expensive and wild and all of the things, but just call, call someone for help. Call someone for help. Eric Richens told witness one that he almost died. Witness one could hear the fear in Eric's voice and tell Eric was scared. At 2 11 PM, Eric called witness two, another close friend and reported, I think my wife tried to poison me. I should be clear, I'm not a medical doctor. <laughs> I will I will I will distinguish in the future. I am not a medical doctor. I am a doctor of law. <laughs> Which doesn't help when people say do do you need a doctor? No. Not doctor law. 2:11 p.m. Eric called witness to another close friend and reported, "I think my wife tried to poison me." Eric told witness two that the defendant had left him his favorite sandwich from the diner along with a note. He said that he ate some of the sandwich, got sick, and blacked out. Well, you you epipenned yourself and drank a bottle of Benadryl. Eric told witness two he felt like he was going to die. Witness two was struck by the tone in Eric's voice and said Eric seemed different, down, and somber. Opioids, including fentanyl, can cause allergic and pseudo-allergic reactions to include hives. Eric did not have any food allergies. On June 18th, three and a half months after Eric's death, the defendant text messaged her best friend about this incident. The defendant wrote, it was Valentine's Day and Eric and I were both working from home that day and I ordered lunch from diner. He never broke out in hives or used an EpiPen. I was fucking with him. He said the sandwich hurt his stomach so he was gonna take a nap. No hives, no EpiPen. Ma'am, you weren't there according to the police. On August 22nd, 2023, nearly four months after the defendant was arrested for the murder of Eric Richens, the defendant discussed this incident in two phone calls, but not in the walk the dog letter slash novel. In a phone call with her mother, the defendant confirmed that she was the person who picked up the sandwiches from the diner on Valentine's Day. She said, we ate in the office, we together, ate in the office. In a phone call with her brother, the defendant discussed buying lunch at the diner that day. The defendant purchased illicit fentanyl shortly before Eric's near death on Valentine's Day and death on March 3rd. 
The defendant occasionally employed Witness 3 to assist her with renovating houses. If this does not say clandestine Kenneth Street anywhere in it, I am going to be mad. Stephen. Stephen super chatted, not me Googling the definition of paramour. She's definitely in the business of misery and took it from the top. Don't, don't make me karaoke misery business. Song. Um, did the defendant occasionally employed witness three to assist her with renovating houses on January 20th, 2022, the defendant text message witness three quote, I don't want to chat with you or quote, I did want to chat with you about something super random exclamation point. Not now at kid stuff exclamation point. I'll call you tomorrow. If that works question mark. On January 21st, 2022, at 7.24 p.m., defendant text message witness three, hey, today snuck away from me. Can you give me a call in the morning around 11.30? On January 22nd at 11.06, the defendant text message witness three, got a sec. Witness three told law enforcement that he spoke with defendant on January 22nd, 2022, and defendant asked him for fentanyl. The defendant told witness three she wanted the fentanyl, quote, for a client, end quote, who had back pain. Witness three told defendant that he would not get her fentanyl, and that the defendant hung up on her. You asked the wrong one, ma'am. On January 22nd, 2022 at 5.30, after a phone call in which witness three declined to get fentanyl for the defendant, the defendant messaged witness three, have another one for you, call me if you get a sec. Witness three told law enforcement during the second phone call, the defendant asked him for propofol. Okay, how about propofol? Witness three told the defendant he could not get her propofol. The text message from January 22nd, 2022, between defendant and witness three were manually deleted from the defendant's phone. What have we learned about manually deleting phone calls from your phone? They still show up on your cell phone records. After that date, the defendant and witness three did not communicate ever again. I imagine that ended uh, the conversation. Sure. The defendant and witness three had communicated regularly throughout the prior year. On May 31st, 2022, approximately three weeks after the defendant's arrest for the murder of Eric Richens, the defendant's mother text messaged defendant three, or text messaged defendant. How did she text message defendant? iPad? iMessage? Maybe? Um, quote, witness three running his mouth, end quote. Hmm. Remember, they did try to get her on witness tampering as well for the um, phone call and the walk the dog letter. The defendant occasionally employed witness four to clean houses. Witness four told law enforcement sometime in early 2022 before Richen's death, defendant called or texted her to ask her to procure some fentanyl for defendant. Forensic analysis of Verizon records for defendant's cell phone show 746 SMS messages and 94 MMS messages and 12 calls between defendant's phone and witness four's phone between the 1st of January and March 15th. These messages were manually deleted from the defendant's phone. The defendant's phone contained messages to and from witness four before and after this time frame. So just during that time frame. Ice Ice Baby in the chat said, Corey sitting with a pharmacological book. Do you have this? No. How about this? No. Keep going. Witness four told law enforcement that pursuant to defendant's request for fentanyl, she contacted witness five for an introduction to someone who would sell her fentanyl. Witness five confirmed to witness four. Um, witness five confirmed that witness four asked her for an introduction to someone who would sell the fentanyl. Witness five elaborated that witness four messaged her through Facebook asking to speak with her and that she called witness four shortly thereafter. A Facebook message from witness four to witness five on February 5th at 1.37 asked, text me if you got a question, won't do it on this. I mean, accurate. In response to the inquiry, witness five provided witness four with a phone number of a fentanyl dealer, witness six. Witness four's phone contained a contact for witness six. The contact is labeled in a fashion that connects witness five with witness six. Witness four told law enforcement, so it wasn't named like a uh, Hannah Gutierrez's phone. Witnesses, witness four, excuse me, <clears throat> told law enforcement that she contacted witness six shortly after receiving his contact and asked to purchase fentanyl. The phone records established that she did text witness six on February 10th, 2022 at 8.52 p.m. Witness four told law enforcement 
that she met with Witness 6 at the Maverick gas station in Draper on February 11th and purchased 15 to 30 round light green blue pills, which she understood to be fentanyl. Witness 4's phone data shows that she called Witness 6 several times, February 11th between 5.19 p.m. and 6.52 p.m. Witness 4 stated those calls were to coordinate a specific timing of the purchase. Witness 4's phone data also shows that she text messaged Witness 6 several times at 7.18 while she was located at the Maverick because your cell phone's going to show where you're calling from. Witness 4's phone data shows several text messages between the defendant and Witness 4 on February 11th, beginning at 3.42 p.m., while Witness 4 was at her home in uh, Heber and continued at 6.23 p.m. as she passed through Linden on her way to the Maverick gas station in Draper. We're getting a full topography of Utah. The defendant Witness 4 text messaged at 7.18 while Witness 4 was located at the Maverick and text message with Witness 6. The messages continued at 8.20 as Witness 4 passed through Lehigh on her way back to her home in Heber and concluded at 8.56 p.m., while Witness 4 was at her home. Witness 4 told law enforcement that she delivered the pills she purchased from Witness 6 to the defendant in a hand-to-hand -hand transaction in the driveway of Witness 4's home, either February 11th or February 12th. Witness 4's phone shows data that in addition to text messages to defendant Corey Richens and Witness 4 exchange on February 11th, the defendant and Witness 4 exchange text on February 12th at 9.58 a.m., 2.49 p.m. and 2.49 p.m. Witness 4 was located at her home during both exchanges. Defendant and Witness 4 exchanged 30 text messages on Valentine's Day. Hmm. Interesting. Witness 4 told law enforcement that in late February 2022, defendant told her that the fentanyl pills she previously provided were not strong enough. Whoop, there it is. Emily, how are they going to prosecute her for attempted murder? That, 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 that in addition to the husband telling someone that he thought she had tried to poison him. In late February, defendant told her that the fentanyl pills she previously provided were not strong enough and asked that she procure some stronger fentanyl. I just, I mean, I was on a Friday night frenzy or Friday night fuck around or whatever with Rob from Law and Lumber. I I'm sure he loves that I call it Friday night fuck around. And we were watching Jelly Roll speak truly from the heart to um, one of the congressional committees about the fentanyl crisis in the United States. And I do not want to make light of the fentanyl crisis in the United States. I imagine that Corey Richen's conversation was something to the effect of, I see on the news all the time that people are ODing on fentanyl by like smelling it, touching it, being in the vicinity of it. Like I, I am hearing on the news that if you are close enough to fentanyl, you will die. What the fuck has gone wrong that he did not die? Like I imagine that this is where she is thinking this is going to go with fentanyl. Like I just thought that fentanyl equals overdose because that is what comes up on the news. That is what we have been told. And that is legitimately something that can happen. We have seen um, law enforcement be harmed by trying to um, procure fentanyl at a scene or not knowing exactly where it is. But I think that's what she thought because I do not think she understands this world at all. Like, this is not her world of things. I think Corey saw... Remember, this is the one that was Googling luxury prisons for rich people. So I think she sees the news and is like, oh, easy. Just like fentanyl equals you die. Great. So I don't think she understood what she was getting into with all of this. That's, um, that's why I think we're in this circumstance now. And he didn't die on Valentine's Day. It is a, it, uh, we're not going to dive down into the, the fentanyl crisis, but watch Jelly Rolls talk to Congress. It is a chilling look at what is going on from someone who understands 
this world that Corey thinks she is going to start to fuck around in to kill her husband. That's not going to go well for her. I don't think, I don't think she knows this world well. Um, that is my impression based on all of these filings. So, Witness 4 told law enforcement, and we'll find the link to, we'll find the link um, for Jelly Roll's speech to Congress and link it down below. It is an incredibly powerful speech to Congress. Um, Witness 4 told law enforcement that in late February, defendant told her that the fentanyl pills were not strong enough. I'm like, can you get me stronger fentanyl? Like, the fentanyl... Excuse me, I need the fentanyl that kills people, please. This is, you did not, you did not give me the fentanyl killed anyone. I anticipated he would die. What is happening? This is going to go over great to a jury. Can you imagine just telling this story to a jury? I can. Former DA, I can. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show that she went back and asked for stronger fentanyl because her husband was still among the living. Witness 4 initially stated that the defendant specifically asked for some of the Michael Jackson stuff, oh, the propofol too, during the second request for fentanyl, but subsequently conceded that the defendant may have referred to Michael Jackson during her earlier request for fentanyl. Michael Jackson died of a propofol overdose. She's like, maybe it would be easier to OD him on propofol. Doesn't propofol have to be administered intravenously? Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, on February 26, 2022, Witness 4 sent Witness 5 a Facebook message saying that asking Witness 5 again provide her with Witness 6 phone number because she deleted it off of her phone because that's what one does. Later the same day, Witness 4 contacted Witness 6 to arrange a purchase of more fentanyl at the same Maverick gas station. Excuse me, we need stronger fentanyl. Witness 4's phone data shows that on February 26, 2022, beginning at 2.25 p.m., the defendant and Witness 4 exchanged several text messages. They continued to exchange text messages between 5.01 p.m. and 10.22 p.m. as Witness 4 traveled from her home in Heber, Utah, to the Maverick gas station in Draper and back home. Witness 4's phone data also shows that she exchanged text messages with the defendant and the witness while she was located at the Maverick gas station. Lots of action at the Maverick gas station in this case. On May 8th, 2020, I mean, it's not a Bucky's. You know, on May 8th, 2023, the defendant was arrested for the murder of Eric Richards and received a copy of the charging document and probable cause statement. The probable cause statement referred to Witness 4 by her initials and contained many facts presented above. On a jail call that day with her mother and brother, defendant said, Eric asked me to ask witness for, for pain pills. She gets arrested for his murder after writing a children's book and says on her jail calls that she should know are recorded. Eric asked me for the pills. And for all of you in the chat confirming that propofol is via IV, I think it goes to um, it goes to her not exactly knowing what she is doing, but also very much it seems from the way it's presented by law enforcement, these are allegations. They have not been proven. She is presumed innocent until proven guilty, but it does seem that she is trying to figure out how to better poison her husband leading up into his death. Internet articles and searches from the defendant's phone. Give it up. This is my favorite part of this case. This is my favorite part of this case. Look, your phone is going to tell on you. Always. Always. This also shows me that most of the people in this case do not do the things they are doing in this on the regular because otherwise they wouldn't have phones that are tracking all this. And I'm not going to say much more about that because what we don't do on this channel is teach people how to crime better. Those who know how to crime know how to crime. We don't need to learn how to crime. We just need to talk about the cases. Internet articles and searches on the defendant's phone. Some of you know what's coming. Some of you don't. 
The defendant used several cell phones, including burners. I mean, she was trying to crime better. The cell phone that the defendant primarily used leading up to and shortly after Eric's death indicates a significant amount of information was manually deleted from it, particularly between January and mid-March 2022. Sometimes the absence of things, Murda, can also indicate what you're up to. Forensic analysis of one of defendant's cell phones shows that by April 16th, 2022, Three days after law enforcement first informed the defendant that Eric Richens died of a fentanyl overdose, defendant's cell phone was used to access websites with the following titles, among others, Utah State Prison, um, Timpango's Women's Facility. What happens to deleted messages? Cause of death usually does not impact life insurance payment. How do police and forensic analysts, analysts recover deleted data from phones and signs of being under fentanyl investigation? Ma'am. Signs of being under fentanyl investigation. What are the police going to do? What are they going to do? Forensic analysis of the same cell phone also shows that on June 6th, the defendant's phone was used to conduct the following internet searches, among others. Can you delete everything from an old iPhone without actually having it? Women, Utah prison, purgatory. We've learned that one of them is purgatory. We learned that on Tuesday. Can cops uncover deleted messages iPhone? Also, this has periods instead of spaces. The amount of searches on my phone, my iPhone, that have periods in, in between spaces. And especially trying to beat the Team Rocket bosses in Pokemon Go right now. Like, the way I can't remember which types are stronger against each other to, to battle those bosses. But they always end up with periods instead of spaces. Like, all of the time. All of the time. Can cops force you to do a lie detector test? Well... The feds can if you take a plea deal. If someone is poisoned, what does it go down on the death certificate as? How long does life insurance company take to pay? What is a lethal dose of fentanyl? Ma'am, maybe you should have Googled that before. <laughs> the defendant was in financial distress at the time of Eric Richen's death. We saw a lot of this in her detention hearing. On April 26, 2019, the defendant informed K. Richen's Realty, LLC, for the purpose of selling, buying real estate, the defendant was the sole, oh, the, sorry, the defendant formed K. Richens Realty, LLC. She's got a bunch of civil lawsuits going on at the moment. The defendant was the sole member of the company. Defendant used hard money loans to finance K. Richens Realty's house flipping projects. At the time of Eric's death, the company owed hard money lenders at least $1.8 million. In the five months prior to Eric's death, Corey realized $170,000 in revenue while, or the, the company, sorry, realized $170,000 in revenue. Its monthly debt service, debt service exceeded $250,000. The company borrowed from over 25 lenders to support its business and service its debt obligations. Despite the existing debt and insufficient revenue defendant continued to use hard money loans to purchase additional properties, including three properties in November, 2021. Dude, you don't, don't chase bad money, man. It is, it is not going to work. Not financial advice. The company banked with America first credit union at the time of Eric's death, the account balance was negative $5,000. You know, I think the banks liked, um, Alec Murdaugh better. Honestly, Corey. Alec Murdoch got a way better deal with his banks than you did. I mean, you're all going to probably end up in prison, but he did get a better deal with the banks. In the five months preceding Eric Richens' debt, the defendant sought to withdraw over $300,000 from this account for which there were insufficient funds. This resulted in 198 separate overdraft and return transaction fees, totaling almost $5,000. Mm. On September 30th, the defendant entered into a revenue purchase agreement with Greengrass Holdings, whereby Greengrass purchased $87,000 in purported accounts receivable across eight companies registered to defendant. Greengrass remitted $60,000 to the defendant as agreed. The defendant did not remit the purported receivables to Greengrass as agreed. The Realty was the only one of defendant's eight companies operating at the time. On December 9th, 2021, three months before Eric's death, Greengrass sued the defendant for $87,000 owed plus interest cost and disbursements. The defendant had a personal checking account with Navy Federal Credit Union, which included a $15,000 credit line. Between August 28th and December 28th, 
2021, the account balance ranged from zero to negative $51. The credit line balance ranged between 13,000 and 14,000. Nevertheless, during this time frame, defendant wrote eight checks from this account, totaling $36,000 payable to herself or the company. Navy Federal returned those checks as unpaid. The defendant had an interest in Eric Richens' successful business only if he died while they were married. We read through all of this in other content covering this case. We read through their prenup. It's attached to one of the multiple lawsuits. There's civil lawsuits going on between the estate and Corey. Like the estate suing Corey and her parents. Corey is suing the estate. So there's a whole bunch of other civil stuff going on aside from this case. Eric Richens and his business partner owned a stonemasonry business called CNE Stonemasonry LLC. They founded the business December 1st, 2009, more than three years prior to Eric's marriage to defendant. In 2020, CNE's adjustable taxable income was over $1.4 million, so their business was doing well. Eric and defendant entered into a premarital agreement on June 15th, 2013. In the PMA, the defendant, quote, released and relinquished all right claim or interest in CNE Stonemasonry LLC. The PMA provides the that following Eric Richens' marriage to defendant, the company nevertheless remains the sole property of Eric. That's what most prenups do. The prenup further provides that the defendant, quote, shall have no right or claim to the business except that if Eric should die prior to the defendant while the two are lawfully married. His partnership interest in the business shall transfer to defendant, meaning if he owns half the business, she gets the half he owned if he dies while they're married. Remember what we just covered about Corey's mom? Like, <laughs> what we covered with Corey's mom was that, um, I don't know where my purple background would go, sorry, is that law enforcement saw that Corey's mom's partner died of an unexpected and sus overdose shortly after becoming the executor of the estate of her partner. Weird. As early as February 2019, defendant told Witness 7, a friend, that she was, quote, trapped in her marriage, Corey, and that the PMA would leave her without anything financially and that she didn't know a way out of her marriage. You guys, we have a quick bits up on the quick bits channel. If you want like the real, real quick rundown of that, um, that search warrant and the information about Corey's mom, it's over on the quick bits channel. There is a second channel for the, like the short, the actually short content, like, you know, actual shorts and like five, 10 minute videos. So February, 2019, Corey says she's trapped in her marriage. And if she leaves, she takes nothing. On December 17th, 2021, defendant told witness eight she felt stuck and trapped in her marriage, and it would be better if Eric Richens just died. Oh, oof. Ma'am. Ma'am. I can only imagine that Eric's family is horrified seeing all of this. Just absolutely horrified seeing all of this. And one day, because all of this is public information, her kids will be too, which hurts my heart for her kids. The defendant mistakenly believed she would inherit Eric Richens' estate. Oh, are we going to get to her punching out her sister-in-law? We might. On October 13th, 2020, Eric Richens consulted an estate planning lawyer. So this is before the, um, before the incident on February 14th, Eric informed his lawyer he wanted to protect himself in the short term from recently discovered and ongoing abuse and misuse of family finances by defendant and to protect his three children in the long term by ensuring that the defendant would never be in a position to manage his property after his death. So he does not believe she is doing smart things with the money. <clears throat> On November 3rd, 2020, Eric executed several estate planning instruments, including a health care directive, durable power of attorney, pour over will, and the Eric Richens Living Trust. In each of these instruments, he appointed his sister, Katie Richens Benson, his agent, fiduciary, or trustee, 
to the intentional and purposeful exclusion of the defendant. Meaning in those, and we're not going to go through estate planning, which is definitely not my strong suit. Um, A, estate planning is needed. B, uh, it is very specific in state by state. So what I will say is that it is made clear that his intention was to exclude the defendant. And that was, so there would be no question about it, no misinterpretation by the court, no argument down the road. Everything is under the control of the sister. If something happens to him, his wife is excluded from everything. He transferred his home and his interest in, in his business to the trust so that if something happened to him, his sister could, could distribute it to his kids. Eric removed the defendant as a beneficiary from a 500,000 New York life insurance company policy on his life and de uh, designated the trust as the beneficiary, which means the life insurance, if something happens to him, the money from life insurance goes into the trust, the money from his business and his business interest goes into the trust, and then his sister can distribute that. On March 6th, 2022, in the immediate aftermath of Eric's death, er yep, yep. Corey found out after he died. Corey found out after he died. On March 6th, in the immediate aftermath of Eric's death, Eric Rich and sister Amy was at Eric's home. Well, Eric and Corey's home. The defendant, Corey, asked Amy to leave the property. Amy responded that the home did not belong to defendant and instead belonged to the trust. Oh, boy. Um, we will talk about why not divorce. I will just note that given different states' family law courts vary on how fathers are perceived, and divorcing Corey, depending on what was going on, if he hadn't discovered the affair and what have you, divorcing Corey and fighting for the ability to see his children could have been tremendously difficult for him. So I, I know some of you are like, why don't they, why didn't he just divorce her? He might have been thinking about that, but knowing that there would be a very, very difficult fight for him to have access to his children. And if he was worried for his children, I imagine he was thinking at some point up until February 14th, okay, I've protected the money from her. We'll see if we can work it out. So I know some of you are asking, why didn't he leave? Uh, it is probably more complex than just being able to leave, if that makes sense. And um, it is it is not always easy. So I think protecting the money first was what he was trying to do to make sure that his kids would be taken care of and then figure out what you do next. Um, and the time between February 14th and March is not very long. Um, so I think he was worried about the money, but was like, okay, but also like I'm, I'm safe in my house. Right. So there's also that. If that helps explain a little bit, cause I see the questions in there. Um, but those are, it is never ever as easy as just leaving. I'm sure his family is like, but just, okay, don't divorce, just come and stay at our house. I'm sure those questions are being asked, but I think Eric was doing what he could to protect his family the best that he thought he could. So, um, if that, if that helps, cause I see a lot of those questions and I think they're, they're genuinely held questions like, but why, but what if, but there it's always more complicated truly than just being able to walk away, especially when children and money are intermingled. Um, but he was worried clearly about what Corey was up to because he moved all the money to try to protect his kids. On March 6, 2022, in the immediate aftermath of Eric's death, Eric's sister showed up and was like, um, the home that you live in is owned by the estate. Because Eric had purchased the home prior to the marriage. So the home was not Corey's home. Hmm. I bet that was a surprise to her because I think Corey fully believed that she was now in charge of the entire estate. <clears throat> I 
The defendant then struck Amy Richin several times. The defendant, in a text message to her paramour, recounted the event. Oh my God, still communicating with the lover. I lost it in on Eric's sister finally and punched her a couple of times. Angry face emoji. My brother ripped me off of her before it got too intense. She called the cops. It was at my own house because I told her to leave and she wouldn't. Said this is her brother's and she didn't have to. So I said, get out or I'll get you out. She's the, she's still being prosecuted for that misdemeanor. They had given her a plea deal. Um, and in giving her a plea deal, she had to do some of the, uh, some of the courses and the, um, thinking errors class. And it seems that maybe she didn't do that. So still texting the lover. Sheriff's deputies responded to Eric Richens home and called Eric Richens, a state planning lawyer from the scene. They're like, let's figure out whose house it is. The lawyer explained to the defendant that Eric Richens had placed the home into a trust and that Katie Richens Benson was the trustee. The defendant's behavior during the conversation led the lawyer to believe that the defendant was learning of the trust and its provisions for the first time. I agree with that assessment. I, uh, I agree with that assessment that Corey was like, what the fuck do you mean that the house, the business, the $500,000 life insurance plan, what do you mean that doesn't go to me? I imagine this was all, uh, all a very interesting realization for Corey. While sheriffs were there, I bet there's body cam video of this going down somewhere. The defendant later told law enforcement she was just now learning after all this happened about the trust in general. The defendant was a, the beneficiary of a significant amount of life insurance on Eric's life. At the time of Eric's death, at least three insurance policies on Eric's life existed with an aggregate death benefit of $1.3 million, the defendant as the beneficiary. A fourth policy existed with a death benefit of $500,000. The defendant mistakenly believed that she was the beneficiary of that policy. That's the one that got moved into the trust. A fifth policy existed that paid approximately $168,000 towards the balance of Eric Richen's mortgage, the house that was in the trust, not in her name. The defendant submitted a falsified bank statement to Ironbridge Financial in support of a mortgage loan application. On January, on July 7th, 2021, the defendant on behalf of the business entered into a mortgage loan with Ironbridge Financial. I'm kind of sad it's not named Forge, just saying. In support of the loan application on June 29th, 2021, the defendant submitted a purported America First statement for K. Richens Realty dated May 31st, 2021, showing an account balance of 210000 plus. Oh, no. Corey, are they going to allege that these are forged bank statements to defraud the bank? Let's keep reading. The actual, yep. The actual America First statement for K. Richens Realty dated May 31st, 2021, shows an account balance of $15,000, not $210,000. Those are different numbers. You, it's Corey. I know people joke about like girl math, um, which can be very funny and memeable, but you can't girl math a mortgage loan application. Um, ask Teresa Judice and Joe Judice what happens when you do. The America First statement for CNE dated May 31st, 2021, shows an account balance of $210,898.61. The transaction descriptions listed on the purported statement, purported equaling, maybe not accurate, that the defendant submitted in support of the mortgage loan application are identical to the transactions listed on CNE's statement. The purported statement that the defendant submitted is compromised, uh, is comprised, sorry, Freudian slip is comprised of the header and K. Richens Realty actual statement and the body of the C and E statement. So cut it together, photo photoshopped. On July 2nd, 2021, while processing the mortgage loan, uh, the Iron Bridge representative noted to the defendant, when I ran your credit, it was lower than I expected. 
Come on, you redacted out the credit score? We're nosy, law enforcement. It's not personal identifying information. I'm being facetious. When I ran your credit score, it was lower than I expected. Looks like there are some delinquencies with regards to a few credit cards. I was just a bit surprised by that. I know you have a lot of money in the bank to cover the expenses. Three days later, the defendant explained, I recently learned about all of this as well. Lol. I'm just a girl. Lol. Whoop, whoopsie doodle. Whoopsie doodle. And then my husband tried to explain to me that this was his doing a while ago. <laughs> I just I just listened to my husband. He handles the accounts. Oops. We are in the process of separation for one of many reasons, but this is one of them to keep it short and sweet. Lol, it's been crazy to say the least. I'm sorry, what? So in July, 2021, she submitted what seems to be a altered, seemingly altered, bank account statement the bank was like so hey this seems odd um you know uh we didn't expect these delinquencies and she's like oh my god i just learned about it lol my husband tried to explain this all to me but like we're getting separated for like a lot of reasons and i'm gonna keep it short but like this is one of them you know <sighs> these men and their finances wild that text message is gonna uh age well. The defendant submitted a falsified bank statement to Bloomberg. Sorry, Bloomberg Financial. Uh, Bloomberg, fin I was trying to put an L in there and I'm like, stop trying to put an L where it doesn't go. Uh, Bloomberg Financial in support of a mortgage loan application on August 4th, 2021. So what a month, a month after this, a month after lol, my husband did it. On August 4th, the defendant on behalf of her company entered into a mortgage loan with Bloomberg. In support of the loan application on August 2nd, she submitted the first page of a purported purported America First statement for the company dated June 30th, 2021, showing an account balance of $702,000 plus. The actual America First statement for that business, dated June 30th, shows a balance of $15,000. The America First statement for CNE dated June 30th, 2021, shows a balance of 702,000. The transaction descriptions listed on the quote unquote purported statement that the defendant submitted in support of the mortgage application are identical as the transactions listed on the bank's statement. The purported statement that the defendant submitted is comprised of the header of uh, K. Richen's Realty, K. Richen Realty's actual statement, and the body of CNE's statement. Oh, wait a second. CNE being the husband's company. Sorry, I read that completely wrong. CNE being the husband's company. So she was cutting together bank statements, it looks like, from her husband's company, CNE Masonry. All right, sorry, it took me a minute to get there, y'all, as I was reading through this. So she was using her husband's business's bank statements in place of um in place of her bank statements. So she wasn't completely changing the numbers. She was changing the name on the account statement. Mm -hmm. Um Shonda Rosa in the chat asked about the bad checks and said, I'm surprised that check kiting wasn't one of the charges. There were a lot of bad checks. I don't know if those are felonies or misdemeanors in Utah, and they did get her on some of the forgery. So the forgery on these are going to be part of it. Let's see. So I that might be why they didn't choose to go with the checks. Um... So she was using her husband's company's bank statement and then putting her company's name on it instead of changing out the entire statement. I mean, I guess you have to change less. 
the defendant submitted falsified insurance application on Eric's life. Oh boy. On January 29th, 2022, defendant applied to true stage for an insurance policy on Eric's life with a death benefit of $100,000. The defendant named him as a beneficiary. The insurance policy became effective February 4th, 2022, 10 days before Valentine's Day. Ten days before the defendant's attempt on Eric Richen's life and one month before Eric Richen's death. Don't you think the insurance companies flag that? Do, do you not think that insurance companies look at you taking out a life insurance policy and then something happening within a very short amount of time and go, huh, that's suspicious? Because I guarantee you, one of the things insurance companies look for is, yeah, we're not paying that. Like, immediate red flag. Immediate red flag. There was a period in time where I worked in the arson unit at the DA's office uh, when I was in law school. And a lot of the arson cases were insurance fraud, like a lot of them. And the defendants always seemed shocked when insurance was like, no. This is no, we're not covering this. This it your garage has caught on fire four times in the last year. And every time you keep talking about having more and more stuff in it. No. <sighs> oh, good lord. The defendant was able to apply for the policy because of her paid membership in PenFed Credit Union. Eric Richens had no affiliation with PenFed. The policy premiums were deducted from her business account. Can your business take out a life insurance policy on your spouse who's not a member of the business? I don't know the answer to that. Eric Richens had no affiliation with this account. The address for Richens provided on the application was a P.O. box solely belonging to defendant. The phone number for Eric Richens provided on the application contained an incorrect digit and the signature on the application that purported to be Eric's is a forgery. On August, I mean, that insurance fraud is not going to be hard to prove. Also, when they charge all of this, it's going to be much easier to get into this as motive if that is what the prosecution believes because all of these are also charged in the same, in the same case. With... Murdaugh, they went to trial on the murder case, and this wasn't all part of the trial, the financial. So they brought it in, but there are evidentiary limitations to bring it in for motive. Here, they also have to charge, they also have to prove these things because they're now charging them all in the same. So it may also be the motive, but they're also separate charges. On August 20th, 2023, three months after the defendant was arrested for the murder of Eric Richens, the defendant's mother. What now? The defendant's mother, while discussing the defendant's finances, asked the defendant about the true stage policy. The defendant replied, don't talk about that one because <laughs> your calls are recorded. The defendant fraudulently claimed insurance benefits from Eric's death. The defendant was the beneficiary of two insurance policies on Eric's life issued by true stage with an aggregate benefit of $350,000. One of the policies issued on May 12th, 2017, and the other on February 4th, 2022, one month prior to Eric Richen's death. Look, I think you should have life insurance um, on folks. I just, uh, there are legitimate reasons to have life insurance. Getting a new policy 10 days before he almost dies is uh, odd timing. On April 28th, 2022, defendants submitted a claim against the policies. On June 7th, 2022, True Stage learned that Eric's cause of death was drug intoxication fentanyl. I imagine red flags on that too. On June 14th, True Stage left a voicemail with defendant requesting a copy of any prescription Eric Richens had for fentanyl. Later the same day, defendant informed True Stage that the fentanyl was not prescribed and that she didn't have any idea how Eric Richens obtained the fentanyl. The next day, June 15th, defendant reiterated that she really did not know where Eric obtained the fentanyl. Authorization for presentment and filing, March 25th, 2024, by Brad Bloodworth, the chief prosecutor. Defendant's last known address. 
Summit County Jail. Oh boy. If I if I were the prosecutors on this case, the number one thing I would be doing is waiting for any jail calls after this drops. Just 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 waiting for her to learn about this and to see what she has to say on the phone about it. Just um, immediately I want to know. The defense hadn't responded in any way to this, so we're just going to go into Utah's uh, Utah's case system real quick to take a look if anything new happened because this was the 25th. We're at the 28th. There may or may not be something there, but we're going to go take a look real quick because uh, I'm curious and I want to make sure we are complete and thorough before we get to Q&A because we're going to get to Q&A in just a moment. But um. That's a lot of new information, isn't it? Uh, Corey, this is a this is gonna be a real, real interesting. What is going on? Hold on. Freaking captcha. I'm trying to stream. I can't do both. Not always super neurodivergent friendly captcha. Um I'm very interested to see if they make a motion to push the preliminary hearing out further. And what happens from here but the prelim is set for may 15th and that's going to be well that's going to be illuminating but she just had new charges so what are we at 11 charges now instead of four i'm glad they changed the drug charge the distribution seemed odd to me uh no new filings since the 25th in utah so there's more subpoenas coming in from other financial services uh, those are all sealed. Mm. Notice of return of service subpoena to 48 hours. What does that say? Is 48 hours doing a, uh, well, we're going to, we're just going to take a look. Notice is hereby given that the state of Utah served the following subpoenas on the 28th of February with regard to the above reference case, 48 hours via email and another law firm. Interesting. Did 48 Hours do a piece on this? Let's see what they're asking for. We're going to go through this document real quick. Because I'm want i curious what they're asking 48 Hours for. Did 48 Hours do a piece on Corey uh, recently? Or I wonder if they're working on it. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. Um, let's see. The Reed case, I think, starts jury selection the 16th. Um, we're going to have to go see what 48 Hours did. Because uh, the, the prosecution would like... The prosecution would like some information. Oh, they sure did. I'm, I'm offended. Let's see what they're asking for, shall we? Defendant, 48 hours. You are commanded to produce via the SDT. Any and all material involving the People versus Corey Richens 48 hours episode that aired February 24th, 2022. So there was one that aired like last month. To include without limitation any video and audio of complete interviews, interviewee submissions, and correspondence. That feels broad. Alternatively, um, you can comply with the subpoena by delivering, mailing, or emailing copies of the requested records or documents to the address listed above. Your further advise that failure to comply with the subpoena may render you liable to proceedings in the state district court to enforce the obedience to requirements of this. That'll be interesting if there is a evidentiary fight over what's being turned over by 48 hours. Uh, I'm gonna have to watch 48 hours. I'm curious who they interviewed. Let's see. This is to a law firm. Any and all non-privileged documents in connection with litigation involving Corey Richens or her company. They're probably gonna fight that as well. Well, I didn't know there wasn't a, uh, there, there was a 48 hours on this, but the prosecution was aware of course they are uh that that was a that was a whole lot law nerds that was a it was a lot of new information i'm going to try to summarize it real quick let me switch my uh screens around i will try to summarize this information and then we will get to your uh q a because i am i am ready to answer some questions and then and then we're going to wrap because I can't stream for five hours every day. I will never get anything else done. And my team will be like, hey, hey, girl, hey. So there's like a bunch of emails that you need to take care of. 
So at some point I'm going to have to like, you know, not stream and actually work. Emily, are you avoiding work by streaming longer? I mean, no, yes. But is streaming more fun than, than working? I mean, other type of admin working? Absolutely. Let's see if we can summarize what happened with Corey. Corey Richen has, let me not say her name weird. Corey Richens has found herself a stack of new charges, including attempted murder from the alleged attempted Valentine's Day poisoning of Eric Richens, wherein afterwards he told friends that he almost died. They said he seemed rattled, and he told friends that he thought his wife had tried to poison him. The new charging document also details some text messages between defendant Corey Richens and her quote unquote paramour. That is exactly the words used in the charging documents, which seems to indicate that Corey Richens during this time was also having an affair. We also learn that more in detail about Corey Richens asking for stronger fentanyl between the Valentine's Day, February 14th incident and Eric Richens death on March 3rd. They are charging her with insurance fraud for life insurance policies taken out, mortgage fraud and forgery relating to the financial things they alleged she was doing leading up to Eric's death. They also very clearly illuminate the day that Corey Richens learned that she was not a beneficiary of Eric Richens' estate and a conversation with a friend saying that she was trapped in her marriage, she wanted out of her marriage, but if she left under their premarital agreement, she would get nothing. There's also a conversation with a friend where she indicates things would be better if her husband was dead. The day that Corey learned, three days after Eric's death, that the home that she was living in belonged to her husband's estate in charge of her sister-in-law was the same day that Corey attacked her sister-in-law and is facing misdemeanor charges for that currently. But what we didn't know before is that sheriffs arrived on scene and got the estate attorney for Eric Richens on the phone. And that attorney made clear to Corey for the first time that Eric had moved all of his assets into a trust controlled by his sister and that the home in his name, his interest in his company, and his life insurance policy of $500,000 all belonged to the trust and none of it belonged to Corey Richens. The state has laid out a financial motive for this case since the detention hearing, but now we see those additional charges, bringing it to 11 charges, including insurance fraud, mortgage fraud, forgery, and the additional attempted murder charge. There's also more information about what Corey was talking to her mother about, including her mom asking about a life insurance policy and Corey saying, don't mention that one. There is so much more that law enforcement knows about this case, but what has been shared about this case in this newest charging document is wild. Corey is still set to go to preliminary hearing on May 15th. That will probably be a multi-day preliminary hearing. We will keep an eye on whether that date gets pushed out due to these new charges or not. I imagine the defense has quite a lot of this information now. And we just saw that unsealed search warrant that I covered both on my long form channel and broke down on QuickBits. Let's get to your questions, shall we? Oh, Lawnards, you have lots of question. Just Raina in the chat said the trust is the biggest fuck you to Corey and I'm here for it. I, I mean, there's got to be body cam footage, right? When law enforcement responded and got the lawyer on the phone and Corey found out that she was not the beneficiary of the estate. Can you imagine that being, that being presented at trial? You think we can get the body cam footage of her finding out because it's going to be something? We can try. Didn't all of this come from the book she wrote for her kids? Law enforcement had been investigating this. I think the reason it is a more um, high profile case that we've heard about outside the state of Utah is because of the book. Like the book 
is kind of the hook to tell everybody else about it. There's more wildness now, but at the beginning of this case, it was like children's book author to all the authors that are offended by her being called an author. I understand, but children's book author writes book about grief arrested for murder of husband. It was a whole, like you can see the headlines and why this became a higher profile case versus, you know, woman murders husband, but we're getting into more of the weeds, which is, um, the walk, the dog letter, Corey trying to get her mom to sneak her crest white strips in to court because she doesn't like the way her teeth look on TV. We're getting into a much deeper financial motive and the fact that the victim was telling his friends he thought his wife tried to murder him. So it's wild. Um, absolutely wild. It's my understanding, Cheryl, that the children are with the sister that is the executor of the estate. What's going on with her book, Royalties? I don't know if her book's still being sold. It was self-published. I don't know if it's still being sold on Amazon or not. Um, now with all these charges, can Corey take a plea? I don't know what she would plea to. And I don't know if the state would offer her a plea. She would have to plea open to the court. And I don't know if the court will do that. I don't know if the court will do that. And what we've learned in Utah is that if she took a plea open to the court, they would be like, okay, well, um, life is the only option here. Like there's, there's no other option. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, oh my, I typed in Google Corey Richens and EDB's current live popped up in videos. Good. We're probably on live trending too. I don't know. There's 11,000 of us here. Don't forget to do the YouTube -y things, but I will go, I will go check. I mean, we normally are when we live stream. We are, we are some of the top streams on the platform because the law nerds are bay and we want to talk about the, the case things. Yeah, we're in, we're in that, we're in that loop. Um, I can't believe the other thing up there is, uh, the young thug trial on day 50. There's been so much going on in the other stuff. I haven't, there's been so much going on in that case too. I can't believe they're only on day 50. So much more is going to happen. Um, Terrace, I can't wait to hang out with the law nerds always. Cindy Y and Tamara, thank you both for the gifted memberships. Um, Bobby said, hey guys and gals. Hey, Bobby. Sassy J in the UK said, Emily, you inspire me as I battle my neuro spiciness. Some days it feels like a battle. Some days it feels like we just give up and go with it. Some days it feels like, oh, I can do this. But every day it's an adventure. As I say, often ADHD is a gift. Sometimes it's the gift that keeps on giving in a good way or a bad way. The great big geek, Sassy J and B2, thank you for the gifted memberships. Uh, David Kamikaze, thank you for the gifted membership. You guys are very, very generous. Sassy J in the UK, thank you for the gifted membership. Jolene, thank you for the gifted memberships. Plastic Noise Experience said, hey y'all, please send some love to my community. Yesterday a man broke into multiple houses and killed four people and injured seven more. Plastic Noise Experience, that is a whole lot. All of our thoughts and the law nerd thoughts are with you. That's a that's an incredible amount to process. And the the violation of feeling safe is um is 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 a wild thing to cover. Disney gal in the chat asked if I'm gonna cover the P. Diddy stuff. I have not seen him be charged yet, but it is my intention to look at that case for the podcast next week. I have covered the Cassie lawsuit on the podcast, so you can go find the breakdown of the Cassie suit. I, what I think I will do is break down the other civil lawsuits, what the feds could glean from those civil lawsuits, what the raids may mean, what process of the investigation they may be in because of those raids and other arrests as they happen. I'm not going to get into all of, all of the speculation other than like, what does this mean for a federal prosecution? So we can absolutely look at, I, there are four other civil lawsuits four or five. Um, so we will not get into every line of everyone. It will be an overview of how do these civil lawsuits relate to the investigation. That's my goal. Vicky gifted one membership. Thank you, Fiona gifted five memberships. Thank you. It's hard pre arrest because these are all, um, these are all allegations at this point. Is she doing an advert while resigning? Not sponsored Steven. I mean, she was like, the clerk's office does passports. Uh, okay, courthouse Becky. Sure. Um, 
C Lynn Adams 32 said, I would have crawled away in silence. I'm really surprised. Katie said campaign speech or resignation speech. I'm really surprised. I'm really surprised that she um that she did that. M on the internet said the plane was a paid actor. Maybe it was Diddy's plane. That was Monday. <laughs> I'm teasing. It was clearly not a Learjet. The plane was paid for by Poot. <laughs> um Drum Corps Freak said she is the type of woman who enjoys sniffing her own farts. Oh my. Well, at least no one's described her as stinky. I mean, that's more than uh, Jody Hildebrandt can say. So, Music to my soul said, I have friends in the low country. I have friends in low country. I imagine that was to the tune of Friends in Low Places. It's a great song. She's not a regular clerk. clerk. She's a cool clerk. Lawnards. There's lots I love about you. First, you know, you constantly work on your healthy boundaries, and that's a hard thing to do in this world. Second, you're hydrated. Most of you can parallel park. I respect that about you. Those of you that have disclosed that you can't parallel park, you're well aware of where your skill set lies. And that is a skill in and of itself. But you guys are so fucking funny. The wit, the humor, the nuance, the intelligence. This is the funniest community on the internet. Han hands down, bar none. And it just, just absolutely makes streaming with y'all a joy. Shady Millennial said, would you enjoy if Miss Becky becomes a star in the Real Housewives of Colton County? <laughs> you know, they say don't go on reality TV if there are skeletons in the closet. So I don't, I don't know if Miss Becky's uh, made for reality TV. Do I want to see a, a, I do I want to see the, the folks on Southern Charm discussing Murdoch and Miss Becky? The crossover we all need. The crossover we all need. Though I did see a blip on the internet that Kyle Richards, this is not a fact check statement. I have seen discussion that Kyle Richards thought it would be great to have Alec Baldwin's wife, Hilaria on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. I did, I, ma'am, what? Yes, let's follow Hilaria through the trial of Alec Baldwin in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and put it on a Bravo show. That would be fascinating. Um, Celine Adams said, why am I intrigued by all things Murdoch? Same. We're invested. We live here now. We're in, we're all invested in South Carolina at this point. Um, M illegal stoner mom. <laughs> You don't have to disclose those things on the internet. Depending on your state, it might not be illegal at all. Started with a gifted membership, and here we are 12 months later. Thank you for the super chat. Beck said, happy Thursday. Thank you. I I, I love this case. Um, Kelly said, this is going to be as juicy as a summer watermelon. Corey Richens is going to be watermelon crawling after reading that. Uh, reading that. Though, uh, I think in custody, they're going to call it Pruno. Can't wait for you to cover the Murdaugh deal or no deal. Uh, yes, Miguelina, go ahead and end the poll. 85% of you said you hadn't heard about the new charges with Corey. And I understand it with like the Diddy stuff and that awful uh, bridge collapse in Baltimore and um, everything going on with uh, the other Utah women. I understand how the Corey stuff kind of slipped under the radar. The mods clocked it immediately um, because the mods are the mods are like the, the, uh, the student teacher research attorneys of of the laundered community they're like did you see this did you see that so good mimsy said i will never understand why someone would put their son in danger of being arrested i mean if you're gonna take down your own son with you hubris is a really wild thing and i think there are people who think that they that it's fine they won't get caught it's just like i mean you have access to it it's gonna be fine right it's gonna be fine right um bless his heart he's trying to make the best of that becky boo dealt him i think i think her lawyer was doing his best um peria i hope i pronounced that correctly i probably did not and for that i apologize the audacity and shamelessness is unreal in in some this is some next level shit yeah it is some next level pr shit i absolutely agree absolutely agree the great big geek said me pulling up playing it's me hi i'm the problem it's me 
I made a it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me joke on Instagram on somebody's reel, and a number of the law nerds absolutely clocked it. It's always funny to me when I comment something and the law nerds are like, girl, we see you. We see you. Insert Kim G, Real Housewives of New Jersey going clink, clink. I mean, all day, every case we covered. Samantha, thank you for the gifted memberships. Carolyn said main character energy, but has back burner energy. <laughs> oh my. Um, Marianne said nothing to do with this stream, but just wanted to say thank you for always breaking into song. If someone someone reminds you of lyrics, makes me feel vaguely normal. I It's my brain. Absolutely my brain. Brandy Rose said, oh my God, I was listening in the background when she said her resignation was effective immediately. I thought the cheering was the audience. <laughs> The kids go wild is my sound effects. There are days when I definitely am reliving like the 90s AM radio show up in here. And the uh, the soundboard helps with that. I try to be mindful of not making your animals crazy or like um, doing anything that is too loud in the in the ear holes. But but um, I absolutely love the soundboard too much. Yet another meeting that could have been an email. Lauren, that whole press conference just could have been a, an, an email. Absolutely. Absolutely. A press conference didn't allow her to look gracious. No, it didn't. Celio, thank you for the gifted memberships. Um, oops, I meant that Nemo wouldn't allow her to look gracious. Oh, that's that's fair. Thanks for the laugh at 3 a.m. Australia when I can't sleep. Gwynny, you are welcome. I don't think I do you guys think Becky looked gracious? Cause um, I really do think she wanted to smile for the cameras and say, I just I just want to be with my grandkids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many emails she's getting asking her about all this stuff. Like I imagine her emails have blown up. Kathy at Oz, thank you for the gift of memberships. Uh, Marianne, Sam Van McVeed sentenced to 25 years. My brain inverted that earlier in the stream. So again, 25 years. Lacey, please say you'll cover the P. Diddy case. Covered the Cassie lawsuit already. We'll absolutely cover the rest of it as it unwinds. Um, yes. Hillary said it's only since paid, but so much longer. I, I don't remember what part of the stream that is too, but thank you. Jack said they call us nerds. Nobody calls us nerds. <laughs> they called us nerds. Nobody calls us nerds. Um, thank you for being here. Girlfriend left for Tulsa yesterday. Splitting paw nerds has been tough. Thank you again, Jack. You are welcome. Splitting paw nerds is very, very difficult. Um, will you review Gina Carano versus Disney when Disney responds next month? Her initial filing was quite silly. I don't know because here's how I see the docket at the moment. We have a very limited amount of time to catch up pre-May on Scientology and Leah Remini, Girardi. There's an appeal oral argument coming up for Chrisley. The 12th accounting is coming up for Brittany, P. Diddy, all of this today. And we've got like a week We've got maybe three streams before Karen Reed starts trial. If Karen Reed doesn't start trial in April, it might shift things. But if Karen Reed starts trial in April, um, we are going to be zoom zooming to get through to get to um, the Karen Reed trial. After the Karen Reed trial, we've got Baldwin, but May has Girardi, which may or may not get pushed out. Brittany on the 12th accounting and the preliminary hearing of Corey Richens hearings in Idaho. So the doc, ugh, the docket is, uh, the docket is, is, is full. Are you going to follow the Chrisley appeal, which is supposedly April 15th? It is oral argument on the appeal. I'm going to do a breakdown of the legal arguments of the appeal on the podcast. I don't know when I'm going to do that breakdown because the because of where the Karen Reed trial is coming up. I am not covering the Chad Daybell trial. I've seen what about Chad Daybell. I'm not covering the Chad Daybell trial. Um, because I really want to carry ca cover the Karen Reed trial. Sorry, a bit behind, but who is Karen Reed? She is a woman being prosecuted in Massachusetts. Her um police officer boyfriend died. She has been charged with murder. There's a lot, there's a lot of questions, like a lot, like a lot. It's a, it's a very strange case. 
Um, it's a very strange case. I will be very interested to see what happens at trial to see what the prosecution prevents. There are like full sideshows going on with that case, but it's wild. So the defense is alleging that this is all a setup by law enforcement, um, that he died at a party with other cops and they're setting her up. That is her argument. Their argument is she hit him with the car and the defense is like, but the that's that's not really consistent with the coroner report. But then there's like video cameras that are missing. There's other evidence that's missing. It's a it's a very, very strange case. Like a very strange case. So we're gonna be, I wanna see what I wanna see how that plays out in trial. So we're gonna see how that plays out. But I am not covering the Chad Daybell case. I did not cover the Lori Vallow case. Um it it was it was enough covering uh Jody and Ruby. Those children survived. I very much stay away from um cases with children victims. The Daybell case is is very, very heavy. I know it will be streamed if you guys want to watch it. I am fascinated by what's going on in the Karen Reed case. Just fascinated. Um, your milk frother is not in your Amazon store. Help me find it, please. Mine died this morning. I will add it into the Amazon store after this. I don't remember which brand it is, but it's one of the just like you pour the milk in and then push the button. Uh, it's not a handheld frother. That, <laughs> my handheld frother motion. Uh, um, is Tati still on the docket? Yes, her trial just got postponed and I have not caught up on the documents. As a PhD candidate, I get it. Some don't consider us doctors. It can be quite annoying. Kate, I understand. You can you can come over and join the conversation with us. But it's like, and where do PhDs fall into all of this? Do we think the judge will um excoriate her at sentencing if she is convicted? <laughs> we gotta get there. We gotta get there first. You guys are asking about um the Idaho TikToker. We are we are waiting for more documents to cover them kind of all at once instead of as they they piecemeal in, but we absolutely have to. Ryan texts RN said, I'm an RN. This got my code blue tingles up. It's a wild case. <laughs> you guys are singing misery business in the chat and it's everything. Um, happy birth, happy to spend my 60th birthday with y'all. Simply Bell, happy, happy birthday. Kristen said, I'm so confused. I thought if I thought my husband was trying to kill me, I'd leave it. Kristen, I, I absolutely get it. Those things can be, um, very, very complex. So I think that Eric was doing what he thought he could. I don't know what he was talking to his family about between February 14th and March 3rd. When there are kids involved, decisions can get very strange. I think if there weren't kids involved, maybe he might have made a different choice, but she sh uh, she is accused of poisoning him. You don't kill people. Don't kill people. Um, You shouldn't have to leave your marital home to not die. It's just wild. So I, I get it, but it's not, um, unfortunately, especially with kids, not simple. So I, I think he was trying to protect the kids financially, as I said earlier, the best that he could. And I'm sure his family is, is heartbroken with all the new information. It, I don't know if heartbroken is the right word. I think, um, rage, I think it would take me a while to get to heartbroken. I think rage. I think rage would come first. Um, Anne said, I can't wait for your take on the judge in the Karen Reed trial. She is something respectfully a law nerd in Norfolk County. I have seen that the judge has repeatedly and vigorously denied the motions for continuance, even though it seems that there are investigations going on into how the DA's office is handling the Karen Reed prosecution. So it's odd. Stephanie said, my baby Travis is three months today. My boyfriend thinks he is named after Kelsey. He's named after yours. Oh my God, Stephanie, that's so sweet. Love you, Em. Let your boyfriend think he's named after Travis Kelsey. It's fine, everybody. Everybody can have their own interpretation. It's such a great name. It's just such a great name. So happy three months to Travis. They're so sweet at that age. Though I gotta say, I know teenhood is different for everyone. But the like sending snarky memes back and forth with my kid is a delightful stage of parenting. Like teenhood has its its rough spots, but 
it's it's mostly because other teens um but it is a delightful the snarky meme stage of parenting is a delightful stage of parenting for me and i absolutely love it i don't love trying to navigate um social media bullying and things like that it is not it is not it is not delightful um but i absolutely just just adore sharing music with my kid watching him discover new music um and and the ability to just like pull up music and and share that is really fun my kid is very very music oriented and it's it's really fun to to um to experience that with him so the the uh, the other stuff can be difficult to navigate because rage Debbie said in the Reed case, there's doorbell video of her car being towed from the scene with the quote unquote broken taillight completely intact. It's bonkers. She was even charged. Debbie, we're going to get in. I mean, I'm going to watch that case as a juror with you guys. There's a whole ass missing dog in the Karen Reed case. There's, there's a lot in the Karen Reed case. We are taking the Karen Reed case as jurors. I will do a brief legal overview of the case before the trial for like, this is a brief legal overview, but we're going in as jurors. Like, tell me what happened because I don't want to get confused between what is known on the internet and what is known in court. I will go back after this trial and look at what is known in the internet versus what was shown in court, but I want to go into all of this. So, um i don't know anything about the gin kid trial that starts next month so i i think we went to the what we're what we're doing but the karen reed case is going to start uh like jury selection april 15th 16th um i refuse to believe that i'm here for two plus years we <laughs> isn't it delightful though we've been through so many trials um courthouse becky farewell tour wasn't on the bingo card right um Adorology said, I can't believe we're still talking murder. I'll watch the verdict from the hospital with my newborn. Now he's one. <laughs> Been watching Emily all his life. Isn't it weird when we see how time tracks? Like it's a lot. For the numerological value of Emily D. Baker Esquire. Well, thank you, Lyndon. I appreciate it. <laughs> 650 is the numerological value. 11K in today is my daughter Riley's 11th birthday. My personal, my kid's personal Uber driver. Happy birthday to your daughter, Riley. It is also a fun age. Lucy Ferry said, having a Britney Spears dance party tonight for my 40th birthday, all the Lonards are invited. Lonards, you are invited. Um, scream and shout, I hope is on the playlist. Colleen said, EDB, thank you for this channel and the community that comes with it. A lot to take in tonight. I hope everyone has a blessed Easter. Thank you, Colleen. I hope so too. We will be in court for, uh, for Good Friday tomorrow, just briefly. Corey is really bad at criming. Google is not a good accomplice. No, you can learn a lot on Google. Like there's a lot of things Google is, is, um, is great for, but I'm really bummed. They left out the luxury riches for the luxury prisons for rich people. Like I'm really disappointed that that didn't make it into the newest it's in other court documents, but, um, it's just one of those details when it's like, what is this case? This is the luxury prisons for rich people case. That is what it is. I know that other, the other media is going to call it like the poisoned husband trial or whatever, but it's the luxury risen, luxury prisons, luxury prisons for rich people. There's no risen prison. Um, you and your son need a music movie reaction channel. Angela at this, at this stage in life, um, he is not on the internet much, maybe down the road, um, maybe down the road, but lately, what have we been at lately? Well, that's in English because there's also, he also loves, loves, loves like not Japanese pop, but like Japanese rock in like, um, uh, oral cigarettes and stuff like that. But a poor man's poison has been recent. He recently found the sick puppies, which is very nineties of him. So stuff like stuff like that <laughs> luxury. He has risen for rich people something like that. My Google history would likely get me arrested for a whole host of things I never did. 
No, see, the thing is, the thing has to happen. There has to be the action thing. Um, there has to be an action thing. So with all of it, my my uh, teen lives loves rock and anime music. Anime music is um, anime music is kind of like who did this song for this anime, and then it kind of goes down the rabbit hole into what he's listening to. But he doesn't listen to most pop music in general. So he, yeah. Anyway um fletcher boy said hi from bellevue tennessee hi from middle tennessee uh let's see all right with all of that let's see uh nico touches the walls i will ask him about that he but uh i don't remember all of the bands he listens to i'm like buddy you just need to share a playlist with me question on the scale of criming skill who's worse so far alec or eric or corey mm. corey has more google searches so I'm going to go with that. Corey has more Google searches, but we haven't gotten to the end of it yet, but she has more Google searches. All right, y'all. Three hours. Emily, it's going to be a shorter stream today. Also, Emily, God damn it. <laughs> We're streaming tomorrow. So download the Lawnard app. We're going to be in court. Hopefully that court hearing will be brief. Here is the plan for tomorrow. I'm going to cover the prosecution's somewhat snarky response to the defense's, the defense's trust me, bro, motion for a new trial. Um, if you need to get caught up on that, we will, you can see that in other content where I went through the defense's trust me, bro motion. That's how we ended up streaming five hours, like a week ago, like a week ago. Um, and so we're there. Um, Heidi said, literally everyone is doing Karen Reed. Please cover Leah Remini. I have been covering the documents in Leah Remini. Leah Remini's court is not streamed. So I definitely try to balance when I am court streaming versus when we are document streaming. I love watching trials. I, and Leah Remini is not going to, if it goes to trial and is streamed, absolutely. But we will get caught up on those documents for sure. But I love streaming. I love streaming trial. Lisa said, is good Friday, not a holiday over there. It really depends on where you live and which government agencies, but it's not a federal holiday. Some places are closed, some places are not, and it very much varies by jurisdiction. So the courts in New Mexico are not closed on Friday. So I'm I'm kind of bummed because Fall Out Boy is playing here in Nashville on Easter Sunday, and my family and I are kind of looking at each other going, but but maybe we go. <laughs> But maybe we just do that. Is it Fall Out Boy? Is it Panic at the Disco? We were talking about it yesterday. And my brain just drew a blank and now I'm questioning myself. One or the other. But my family's like, maybe we, maybe we figure out if we just go to a Sunday night concert. So that's the plan. I will see you in court tomorrow. Get the Lawnard app. It's going to keep you in the loop with everything. That is the best. That is the best place to know when we are streaming, what we are streaming, how we are streaming. So go get the app. Um, there's, there's lots of you in there. We would love to have more Lawnards in the app. I will be, um, keeping you in the loop if we see any more filings from Murdaugh's team today. And those updates will be in the app as well. I also used to hop on Instagram live on occasion and break things down as they would happen quickly. We are going to be notifying that in the app if we do that going forward. And those will be here on, uh, YouTube. So that's, the plan you guys are like not panic of the disco must be fallout boy probably is i would i would have to agree so tomorrow will be a shorter stream i promise thank you to the mods thank you to my producer megalina thank you to the law nerds don't forget to do the youtube things i will see you soon bye you can stay up to date with everything i'm covering and fast notifications on our free ios and android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for lawnerd you can also follow me around social media and don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a law nerd.